Trek Profiles Podcast, Episode 19, recorded January 2019. This is the Trek Profiles Podcast, where each episode we sit down with a Star Trek fan, we learn their story, and we try to get to the beating heart of their Star Trek fandom. I'm John, your intrepid host of this whole enterprise, and I welcome you to this, the Trek Profiles Podcast, episode 19. If you wish to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at feedback at trekprofiles.com or on Facebook or Twitter at Trek Profiles. If you wish to leave us a voicemail, you may do that as well via our automated line at 609-512-LLAP. That's 609-512-5527. Warning! As we record this, we have completed all four short treks after Season 1 of Star Trek Discovery, so all previous Trek content up to and including that point is fair game and may be discussed during this episode. You have been warned, human. As always, my trusty sidekick and co-host is the slightly cagey, always classic, yet never contemptuous M5 Multitronic Unit. M5 is at full power. M5, let's have the news and weather. Messages displayed. This show is part of the Tricorder Transmissions Podcast Network. We do our very best to bring you a wide variety of Star Trek-related shows, so please do check out some of the other amazing stuff on the network. You're going to find something you like, I guarantee it. And if you like what you hear on the network, you can support us on Patreon at www.patreon.com slash the Tricorder Transmissions. We are in the process of upgrading and expanding our supporter tiers at Patreon as I record this, adding even more fun stuff and even more benefits for you, our wonderful Patreon supporters. Thank you. There are other ways to support this show and the network as well. Sharing the show on your social medias is also helpful, along with your ratings and recommendations and reviews in your podcasting app of choice. We'd appreciate it. And that means it's time for Kobayashi Maru questions. These come from episode 17 with Tyler Cardwell. Question one, which is the nicer uniform, the Monster Maroons or the TNG Dress Whites? Tyler said the Maroons, but in a stunning upset, the Dress Whites won on Twitter by 52 to 48%. Question two, which is the better way to start your day? Pajuda, cold, or Pajuda, hot with lemon? Tyler said cold, and so did all of you, 60 to 40%. As an aside, it is very cold in space. Question three, if you were to be held prisoner by a Star Trek baddie, would you rather it be the Sheliac or the Breen? Tyler said the Sheliac, and so did all of you, by 65 to 35%. Under the Treaty of Armands, section 447, paragraph 84, we take no position on this on the Truck Profiles podcast and refer you to the Shelliac Corporate for any further details. Question four. Who's chasing you? The Crystalline Entity or the Doomsday Machine? Tyler was convinced that the Doomsday Machine was the right answer, but Twitter said otherwise by 62 to 38% in favor of the Crystalline Entity. And finally, question five. You are a 24th century Ferengi child. You've obtained a whole box of authentic Marauder Mo action figures. Take them out of the box for loads of Ferengi kid fun or leave them in the box for an investment opportunity. Many of you showed some grit and delayed gratification by selecting the action figures by 80 to 20 percent. And Tyler was also in agreement. Apparently, you all have the lobes for business. That's it for the messages and communiques. Let's move on. M5, let's run the show. He thinks that Enterprise is the most underrated Star Trek. If forced to pick a favorite captain, he'd say Janeway. He thinks the Ferengi are the most hilarious and the Tholians the most interesting Trek aliens. You can find him on the Twitter at M-A-F-N-O-O-R, Mafnur, and he's also a professor of biology at Duke University and the editor of Evolution, the International Journal of Organic Evolution. He is from Durham, North Carolina, North America, Earth in Sector 001. It's Professor Mohammed Noor. Welcome, Mohammed, and thank you for being on the podcast. Hello. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Mohammed, are you a Star Trek fan? Uh, yes, of course I am. <laughs> what is your earliest Star Trek recollection? So I remember back in the 1970s going with my parents on a trip to Florida and we were visiting some friends of theirs there. I'd seen, I think I'd seen Star Wars at the time, but I'd actually never watched Star Trek, even though I had heard of Star Trek. 
And I remember on the TV, there was an original series episode playing. It was the one uh, for The World is Hollow and I Have Touched the Sky. Not necessarily the best episode, but you know, it's an episode nonetheless. <laughs> and I remember watching it and thinking, wow, this is really interesting. What is this? And asking the people, who were, there were some kids there asking them what about it. And as soon as I got back, I said, I, I want to find this on my TV. So I you know, pulled out the, the weekly TV week out of the Sunday newspaper, found out when Star Trek was playing and started watching it right then. I love that episode because it's one of the few times uh, McCoy has a little bit of a love story. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I always felt bad for the guy getting upstaged by Kirk and Spock in the, in the romance <laughs> department, you know? So yeah. it, was, it was good to see the doctor getting his every once in a while. Definitely so. <laughs> so. So where did you grow up? I grew up in Hampton, Virginia. Okay. So you were watching it on a uh, local TV and syndication, I imagine? Exactly. You know, what, what's weird I found about what, growing up like you did watching it in syndication is that you had to watch an episode that was selected for you every day yeah. as opposed to one you picked. And it's a totally yeah. different world now in streaming. Oh, it really is. It really is. It's shockingly different. And it's funny to think back to the, those days or even the intermediate days when you could tape something with your VHS player, <laughs> things like that. Now you can just pull up whatever you want, whenever you want and watch it. It's, it's kind of amazing now. I don't think kids understand just how different it was back then. So that was in syndication. And then the movies came out, obviously. Yes. Yes. And, and next gen came out. Were yeah. you staying consistent with your Trek viewing as you oh, were yes. growing up and watching all of this? Absolutely. I remember very much watching uh, the very first episode of Next Gen as it aired. And I was very excited. And I got my parents to sit down with me and watch it. They weren't quite as impressed as I was, but I thought it was very interesting. So I have to admit, partway through second season of Next Gen, <laughs> I, I started thinking this wasn't as good as I, as I was hoping it would be. And it's particularly that season finale at the end of the second season kind of turned me off a bit. So I took a little bit of a hiatus then. Now that hiatus wasn't very long. It was probably on the order of months or maybe close to a year. Cause I know I was back before the, the big best of both worlds cliffhanger. <laughs> now, what was that second season finale? I, I don't remember which one it was. Oh, uh, that was the one where they had clips from the season as Riker was remembering. Oh, them. shades of gray. Like, yes. Oh, <laughs> Oh, that, that, oh, terrible. It was pretty bad. <laughs> they, they might as well have called it the we ran out of budget episode. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I wasn't a big fan of Dr. Pulaski. I mean, she was OK, but I wasn't a big fan of her. And I really liked Dr. Crusher. <gasps> sorry. I'm, I'm totally a Pulaski <laughs> fan. All right. We're fighting. <laughs> oh, no, <I'm> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know what? And this isn't a, 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 anything against uh, Gates, but I, I thought the uh, Pulaski just had a much stronger point of view as written. So it gave, yeah. gave the actor more to do. You know, true. Than, true. than I think Gates really ever got written for her. Yeah. So I, I to, to me, that's what it was. And I, I just enjoyed the fact that she had a, a she had a strongly written point of view. But you know, I, I know people can fight me on that. That's fair. I, I didn't like how she treated data and how she reacted to data, at least in the early in the season. So that kind of turned me off at the beginning. Fair enough. So in our emails back and forth, uh, one of the things that you made reference to with me is that you built a, a web page, which I'll put up a link to on uh, the show notes on trekprofiles.com to, to actually help you pick Star Trek episodes. <laughs> That's watch. right. So I assume then that you are not a serialized sort of disciplined rewatcher. You like to just uh, have an episode, you know, have the website generate an episode for you to watch. Pretty much. Yes. I mean, I, I like to if I'm, if I'm cooking dinner, I like to just pick something and watch it and, and just see it. It's, it's sometimes a little bit hard just coming in the middle of something like, uh, say, for example, the third season of Enterprise, which was very arc based or a lot of Deep Space Nine or all of Discovery. But since I have seen all of them, it's fine just coming in the middle. I'll say, oh, yeah, I remember this. and I'll, I'll pick it up from here. And if it's and if it's a thread that I'm really excited about, I might go ahead and watch the next series, the next episode after that. But usually it's just yeah, get something different. I'll, I'll get tired of it. Maybe I'll, I'll watch three or four next generation in a row. And I'll say, yeah, I'm done with that for a while. Let me let me do an enterprise or a discovery or something like that. Oh, I think that's perfect. I, right now I'm being very disciplined because I, I started a, a rewatch a few years ago and just am doing the whole thing chronologically. So I did all yeah. of POS, I did all of animated, all of next gen, all of Deep Space Nine. And right mm -hmm. now I'm in uh, Voyager season three. And when I get Excellent. done with that, I'll do Enterprise and, mm -hmm. and of course, Discovery I'm watching as it happens. Mm -hmm. So um, after that, maybe I'll use your selector and I'll come <laughs> back around. I don't know. <laughs> well, although I will say this. I, I don't know how you feel about this, but I, mm -hmm. I, I feel that when we're binging these episodes, we sort of see things that you don't necessarily see when you just kind of watch them as one offs. That's true. That's absolutely true. And absolutely true. You, you have these uh, moments and I'm thinking of like uh, Deep Space Nine, for instance, season seven, where it's like, OK, we're right in the middle of the war. Right. And like, mm -hmm. all right, big high stakes 
things are happening. And if you're binging it too, you, you feel that tension much more mm-hmm. so than when you're watching it episode by episode. And then mm-hmm. all of a sudden, boom, let's talk about baseball for a whole episode. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, it's sort of, you know, it, whereas if you're just like turning the TV on and that episode is on, it's fine. It's yep. fine. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but when you put it in its place and, you know, it, you're, it's sort of like, let's do a musical number in the right in the middle of Band of Brothers, you know? And yeah. Like, no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Enterprise did that in the Zindi arc with, uh, with North Star, which was basically like a Western almost in the middle of the, in the middle of the, the, you know, going to try to save the earth from this, you know, evil empire. <laughs> got it. Got it. So you've seen Sydney. all 700 and something hours of Star Trek then? Yeah, I saw I saw them all. Well, I saw original series, like like I said, in syndication, all the rest. I pretty much watched them as they came out. But then as I was preparing my my book, I went back through all of it because I had to make sure I didn't miss something as I was going through it. So I didn't watch, rewatch every single episode, but I got the scripts for all of them. And every night I would go through one or two episode scripts in order and then maybe watch one episode just live because I'd be tired of just reading so much. So I. I very recently went through everything. <laughs> nice, nice. So your your Trek knowledge is up to date. Yes. Good. Do you find that coming back to maybe episodes that you were introduced to as a kid that, that you had a different reaction to them or or the same? Very much a different reaction to a lot of those episodes. <laughs> say, say, say more about that. Um, well, one of the most striking things is obviously the you know, 1960s uh, in terms of what we what we think is acceptable in terms of the role of of women uh it's different from what it is today so when i when i watched as a kid those episodes from the original series it, it didn't even occur to me that you know oh wow the the women are all barely wearing anything and they're you know often just kind of these side characters that are there to be a love interest to kirk and that's about the end of their substance now i notice that much more <laughs> so that's a little bit of a turn off at times, but at the same time, I understand that it's a different era when that, when those were aired and it was actually progressive for the time, you know, showing all these people from different ethnic backgrounds and, ha- you know, having somebody on the bridge who was a woman, you know, uh, Lieutenant Uhura. So, you know, for the time it was great, but it's noticeable now that it's, it's somewhat dated. I, I always joke about what people are wearing saying that, females from other alien species must thermoregulate very differently from the males. <laughs> you tend to see the males in these big robes and the women wearing this little weird little crisscross thing. And that's it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, Bill Tice, who was the costume guy on, on the original series, he had this point of view uh, when designing costumes for ladies, which I don't mm-hmm. know if you ever heard this, but mm-hmm. his point of view is that the more it looked like the whole thing was like held together by a small thread with a little bit of scotch tape and it looked like they were just about to burst out of the thing the better yep. the costume oh well he must have thought he had very good costumes <laughs> you know, yeah yeah <laughs> no, he, he wanted to make it look like the whole thing was about to fall apart any second and yeah. you know they were about to be nude i guess yeah okay so when you watch star trek nowadays uh how are you watching it are you watching it on like a little phone a big screen a mix of those or, or what usually on my ipad and it's often while i'm cooking dinner i'll often just you know pull up my ipad set it beside the stove as i'm cooking and i'll, and I'll play a random episode so do you find that that affects how you're enjoying the episode? I mean, like, for instance, I'm thinking particularly about like the the TOS remasters, which have a very different sort of look to them in some of the scenes, you know, the exteriors mm-hmm. and, the, and the special oh, yeah. effects. How does that affect your ability to enjoy the episode? I, I feel like I enjoy it pretty well. I mean, I, I can tell it's different from what I saw before because I can see that it looks, you know, much newer and much shinier than it was at the when I used to watch it as a kid. But. I don't feel that that in any way inhibits it. I should note that's just for uh, watching old episodes. If I'm watching like a new episode of Discovery, I'll usually sit down at, at, on a big TV and watch it there. there there's a lot going on in Discovery. Yes. I mean, just yes. from a, a design perspective, right? I mean, oh, yeah. every screen has like things in the background and, you know, oh, all, yes. this, all this stuff happening. So I completely oh, yeah. get you there. Yeah. Uh, I, I pretty much watch all the Discovery ones twice as they come out. Like I'll watch one right after it releases, but I'll watch it again later and try to pick up other little things that I didn't catch. Yeah, usually what I'm doing is I, I watch it the first time just straight mm-hmm. through and then I watch it the second time with the subtitles on and I yes. make live tweet comments and uh, uh. I, I, I make gifts out of the episodes for my own amusement <laughs> and post those uh, usually for comedic effect. That's great. Um, yeah, you know, I did, I did notice with Discovery with my second watch through at the at the mid season finale, I did notice Lorca typing something into his little console and I actually paused the iPad and went back and replayed it and, and froze on it. And I could see the thing where it said. Lorca G override. And so I knew that that he had done something which got them to go to what ended up being the mirror universe. So that helped. If I had just watched the very first time, I would not have picked that up at all. Right. In all modern TV, 
it, there's really two mindsets for the show creators, right? They have to yeah. create it for first run. And then they also have yep. to think about, you know, the people who are going to obsessively watch the th- rewatch the thing on yeah, Blu-rays exactly. and yep. all of that, you know, so there, there's, there's all these other things that are going on there. Yep. Um, do you collect anything? You mean like cards and things like that? Not really. No. <laughs> any, any Star Trek items uh, in your, in your home? If we, if we were to go through it. I have a lot of items, but I don't intentionally collect them. So I have a couple of posters. I have um, actually here in my office. I'm right now in my office at work. There's a little wall mount of what do you call it? The 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 little thing that they push in the original series to like an intercom with a with a real, little red alert light above it. Oh, the wall communicator thing. Yes. yes, that's it. The wall communicator. Yes, I have one of those things in my office. I have a Tribble both at home and in my office. <laughs> the, the kind that you know when you make a sound, it actually makes it start either screaming or doing the purr. So nice. I, have a lot of little, I have a lot of little things like that. I have a couple of little ornaments. I have a Whoopi Goldberg as Guinan on my desk too. Oh, is she a favorite? No, I just I think somebody gave it to me for my 23rd birthday, and I've just kept it ever since. It just lives on my desk. <laughs> nice, nice. Oh, there's nothing wrong with that, you know. Yeah. I, I'm not a, much of a collector myself, so I, I never felt the the urge to get it. But there are mm-hmm. people out there that are really into that stuff, and I'm always yeah, interested to find out what that's all about and, and why people like that stuff so much. So, yeah. have you ever been to a Star Trek convention? I have. What was your first Star Trek convention? So you mean specifically Star Trek or something that had Star Trek in it? You tell me. Or, or, your, or your choice. Oh, well, let me start with the whole thing. So 2014, I went to my first real convention. That was Dragon Con in Atlanta. Dragon Con has a lot of different fan tracks. And one of the fan tracks they have is this Trek track. Prior to my going to Dragon Con, I tweeted to actor Garrett Wong, who plays Harry Kim, mm-hmm. and said, Hey, are you going to be there? Because you know you're one of my son's favorites. I've been watching Voyager with my son right around that time, and I'd love to you know get an autograph from you. And he tweeted back to me, you know, within within a day, saying, "Yep, I'm going to be there." I remember being just, "Wow, this this movie star tweeted back to me," and being really excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we went. It turns out I didn't know this at the time. Turns out Garrett actually runs the Trek track at Dragon Con. So I went to various panels over there. I think that year, Jerry Ryan was there. And I forget who, who the other uh, guests were at the time. But I, I got to meet him in person, which was great. We even went to dinner, which was really nice. Um, yeah, but uh, it, was just, it was just a lot of fun. I, I dressed up, I think, at the time as a zombie red shirt. So I just got a regular red shirt uniform, and I just wore zombie makeup. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So actually, that's right. Actually, the picture I got was with Garrett and with Jerry Ryan. And I had her wear this glove with these tubes on it and have, uh, up against my head. So it looked like I was being assimilated. <laughs> very good very good so that was that was really fun and the, and the panels were really interesting just hearing like a lot of the backstories on the on the shows the first fully star trek convention i went to was in 2016 i went to the las vegas convention it was fantastic i really really enjoyed that a lot got to meet a lot of the cast hear interesting stories meet a lot of fellow fans and hear stories about what brought them into trek one thing i noticed from both those conventions which i didn't know about before was just how much science goes on at conventions and there's a lot of these sort of science talks about like the science behind this. So, for example, at Dragon Con, I think that year they even had an economics of Star Trek panel there that was very interesting. There were also ones from other tracks too. One one of my colleagues here at Duke University, his name's uh, Professor Eric Spana, he gave a talk on the genetics of wizarding in Harry Potter. <laughs> nice. So this was really good. And um, what I did then is I asked Garrett. Garrett happened to actually be coming through my town at one point about a year and a half later. I asked him when he came through if it would be possible for me to do one of these Trek track talks on the science behind Star Trek. And he said, sure, we're always looking for more material. So I made the, I made a talk on basically depictions of evolution in Star Trek. And I gave that in 2016 at Dragon Con. And that was really exciting. It was really fun. And I got a lot of positive feedback to it. So it's something I've continued to do since that time. Yeah. So a couple things on that. One of the things sure. I always find most interesting about seeing how people cosplay is not just when people do, you know, just sort of the standard uniforms, right? I mean, you know, some people put a lot of effort into them, but we've yeah. all seen the Star Trek uniforms, right? Yep. It's when people do the mashups. So you were saying yeah. like the zombie red shirts, yeah, or or people doing like a Star uh, Starfleet Jedi or mm-hmm, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. other crazy things. I mean, I, I did one one year. <laughs> I I did. I tried to pick of the most uh, silly sort of mashup I could come up with, and so I did Breaking Borg. <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> so, i had a i had on one of the hinden uh, heisenberg hats from breaking mm-hmm. bad and i had a, a borg appliance that dispensed blue candy so you know you, you, you gotta have fun with it right i mean that's the, that's the whole point mm-hmm. okay so you did one of the presentations at dragon con which of course has a lot of of stuff going on right mm-hmm. and i'm always interested when talking to people who are actual experts in these types of things 
Do you find that that being a, a scientist and your particular discipline is biology, of course, mm -hmm. um, that knowing about these things affects you when they're doing like an episode that has a lot of actual or purported biology in it? I notice it more than, for example, somebody who didn't have the same background biology would. It never bothers me, though, even when it's even when it's kind of bad, it never really bothers me because I know it's fiction. I know I'm, I'm watching this for entertainment. I'm not watching this for education. So it's fine in that sense. But it's it's definitely noticeable how sometimes even recent scientific results uh, worm their way into different episodes and things like that. So I, I definitely find it very curious and it, and it piques my attention. I, I often wonder, just as an observer of the show, and I'm sure that there's some resources on this and maybe people out there on Twitter can point us to the right direction. but. Mm -hmm. uh, on a lot of the show, on all the Star Treks, they've always had some sort of science consultant of some type. Yes. And they're obviously asking this person for opinions and they're telling <laughs> them like, this is bad. Don't don't do this, you know, or, mm -hmm. or this is not possible. And then they go ahead and mm -hmm. do it anyway. <laughs> yeah. And, and so Andre Bromanis, I know, did a lot of the ones for later Next Generation, as well as Deep Space Nine Voyager, things like that. I mean, he is a physicist and I've, I've asked him about this and I know he he's gotten help from people with a stronger biology background. But. You know, what always is going to happen is story is going to trump science. I mean, if they have to have this person get this place because of some explosion that could never happen. Well, you know, it's going to happen. <laughs> 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 so there are times when I feel like, you know, maybe if they had a little bit more time, they could have just changed a couple of words here and there. And it actually would be scientifically accurate. But realistically, yes, that that might maybe a tiny bit bugs me. But the vast majority of people, it's fine. <laughs> they can just watch it. They can enjoy it. And they know it's fiction and it's all okay, even if the science isn't perfect. <laughs> as long as they're not coming out of that and saying, you know, well, I, you know, this is obviously how something works because I saw it on Star Trek, right? As, yeah. as long as they don't make that mistake. <laughs> Hopefully they don't do that. <laughs> can, I, can I loop back to something you said earlier about the, you were talking about cosplays. <laughs> <laughs> we had some fun cosplays at the Star Trek Las Vegas convention. So I went with my with my wife and my son. My daughter didn't come. She's not as much of a Star Trek fan. But um, <laughs> we did we did kind of mashups, as you were saying, where we did we tried to link political things. This was in 2016, so this was the presidential election was was in full swing at that time. We tried to do mashups between politics and Star Trek. So I wore a T shirt that had uh, a picture of Wayun, the Vorta from Deep Space Nine. Yes, but I. But I put Trump hair on top of him and I had a, a slogan underneath it that said, make the Dominion great again. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> my wife had one with um, with a Ferengi on it. And it said, I can't, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was something about Bernie Sanders. It said something like, uh, vote Ferengi. It's good for greed. <laughs> you know, and then on the back, it said, never mind, feel the burn, vote Sanders. Oh, my, my goodness. Son, my son had this big uh, a Janeway on the side with a J with the arrow, like the Hillary arrow. OK. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> and it said Janeway 2016 action, not emails. Oh, nice. <laughs> I, I always enjoy it when people get creative with that stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, the, the one thing I'm always sensitive to, is, especially doing this show, is that mm -hmm. I'm aware that there are a lot of different kinds of fans out there and yep. people take all different kinds of lessons from star trek and i've had guests mm -hmm. on on this podcast that you know look at an episode of star trek and come out with some very different uh lessons than than what other people are taking from the same episode i would refer mm -hmm. any listeners to this to the tim sandifer episode i did he had a particular point of view on on some on tos episodes and, and on tos generally and so i want to ask you did you get any reactions to that that were negative or positive only positive, mostly because none of them were really insulting in that sense. I mean, none of them were, were really like, I mean, we we're sort of lightly making fun of all three. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody reacted negatively. Every way was very positive. I don't think now I would wear the the Wayun one. <laughs> Make the Dominion great again. I don't think I would get the same sort of just ha-ha laughs as, as, uh, as I got at the time. <laughs> right, because times change, right? And, you know, there, there are people changed. who are definitely spun up one way or the other about politics, exactly. right? Yeah, so. Exactly, exactly. So is that really your your big cosplay? I mean, um, you sent me a picture to use, which we'll put up on Trek profiles of you sitting there in a in a red shirt. So you have mm -hmm. a, a Star Trek uniform, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My son had a better cosplay, actually, in the middle of the Star Trek convention where my, my wife made a full Tholian costume for him. And he actually wore that in the parade there. That was that was pretty intense. <laughs> oh, you mean like with all the spindly legs and everything? Yes, exactly. <laughs> now, was this like a big giant thing that was like was, five feet across? No, no, it wasn't that big. It wasn't that big, but it did have the big spindly legs and he had to sort of walk with them as he was going around. Because <laughs> I, I, I was at the 2016 convention and I believe I, I know I might be confusing what year it was, but I seem to recall somebody having a really gigantic Tholian costume. Yeah, no, this one wasn't gigantic. It was just, it was his size. And he was, he at the time was, um, 
2016, he would have been 12. So 12 year old was wearing it. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. So for yourself, um, mm-hmm. do you, you have the red shirt. Do you, do you have any other uniforms or costumes? Yeah, I have, I have an original series red shirt and I have the next generation jacket. I don't think, I think that's it. No, what I've done a few times at, at various conventions is I've, I've altered the original series red shirt to be a, um, parallel or mirror universe one right i have like a gold sash and i have a little thing i put on top of the insignia that looks like the mirror universe insignia so i've, I've done that sort of alteration to it periodically but that's that's pretty much all i have in terms of just uh standard uniforms nice nice now you're also the author of a book which you made reference to mm-hmm. live long and evolve what star trek can teach us about evolution genetics and life on other worlds which i read in preparation for this thank you um, oh you're welcome you're welcome i i enjoyed uh, i enjoyed reading it and taking notes to ask you about things i didn't understand so we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit but my my first question for you really is is that your first venture into writing something for star trek or star trek related yes absolutely that's my first yeah that's my only venture <laughs> doing anything star trek related like that i mean the the closest i've done is the convention talks and i had a, a not just that evolution convention talk that I mentioned, but I started making a couple of others. And those ended up becoming either chapters or sections of chapters in the book. Are you going to be presenting at STLV this year? I, I've volunteered. I mean, if they if they say it's OK, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> oh, that's exciting. What did you pitch? If you can, if you want to share. It's actually the, the original one. But basically, the it's essentially chapter two of the book. Uh, why are there so many humanoids in Star Trek? Nice. I, I just love the ethnocentrism of that term. <laughs> it's so great, right? And 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 I always get a kick out of it when the aliens use it. Like some Cardassian will say, "There's humanoids down there." You know, it's like, would they really yeah, say that? You know, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, they they made fun of that a little bit in Star Trek Six. Do you remember uh, there was a comment about basic human rights, and and one of the Klingons called out the person who said it. So look, even your language is is racist. You're saying human rights. <laughs> oh, as it were, who I think is made of win. Uh, that was the daughter uh, of, yeah. of 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 uh, the Chancellor, and she yep. she's like, oh, the Federation. It's a Homo Sapiens only club. You know, I, that's right. She, exactly. She was just, <laughs> I love that movie. <laughs> I just, I love it when they call the Federation on their BS. You yes, know, I because agree. The, the Federation is so full of BS in so many ways. <laughs> you know, I mean, you have you have all the high minded stuff. You know, that you know, this is where the Federation, and here's how we roll, and you know, we are the mm-hmm. most noble and the most wonderful. By the way, Section Thirty One, pay them no mind at all. You know, <laughs> that's exactly right. Made them no mind at all. And and then, you know, one of the episodes the M5 told us we should talk about a little bit later is um, Tuvix. And yes. while there there are some biological things that you and I definitely should talk about, uh, one of the things that, that gets me in that episode is like, let's seek out new life. There's new life. I'm going to kill it. Yep. <laughs> you know, I'm going to kill it because I want my Vulcan friend back. So right. you die, right. you know, and I yep. think, wow, is that, uh, is that really the thing we want to say about ourselves? Are you sure about that? Yeah. I don't know. I think there's a whole, um, it was not even obvious why you need the Vulcan back. You pretty much have all his knowledge right there. I mean, why, why do you need somebody who's just Tuvok? Well, anyway, we'll come back to that. <laughs> I honestly, for the life of me, cannot figure out why this is even a debate. And 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 I, and I know I know that there are people out there who are telling me that I'm wrong, and they're firing up their Twitter and they're firing up their emails. They're going to blast me in the face with both barrels. I get it, but I just watched that episode, and you know, yeah, me too, in sequence because I'm I'm watching Voyager, and oh. I was loving Voyager right up until that episode, and then I was like, <laughs> no, no, this is just n- no, absolutely no, just like noped out of the whole thing. I, I I'm, yeah. I'm still watching it, and I, I will continue to watch it, but of course. Uh, <laughs> my opinion of Janeway fell uh, considerably <laughs> and, uh, based on that. I remember my son, who at the tw- again was about 12 at the time. I remember him thinking, like, I really like Tuvix. That's sad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I did too. And, you know, it's uh, it, what what I think, again, we're going to talk about it again from the from the science aspect, but yeah. but from the purely philosophical and ethical perspective, I didn't feel that the episode actually considered both sides and didn't. It looked like Janeway's mind was all made up. Yep, very much. And so. while she was just sitting in her office, she was more thinking about, mm, do I have any other options or am I going to do the thing? I'm going to do the thing. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, do I have any other options? And it wasn't really given a fair hearing the other side. And and yeah. that, that's something that really got to me about the episode. And I, I, I know this is going to get me in trouble, but I, I can't imagine Picard making that decision. 
Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think you're right. <laughs> so, I, I don't know. I mean, people can feel free to beat me up about it, but you know, it's, <laughs> I, that's just how I felt uh, as I uh, as I watched it. And by the way, if anyone's listening to this and you don't know, I, I'm tweeting my Voyager rewatch. So you can find me on Trek Profiles and I tweet every episode and what I think about it and put comments mm-hmm. and screen caps up there. So feel free to you know share your opinions in a kind way. Or if not to, that's all right. As long as, long as, as, long as it's in a spirit of love, let me have it. Okay, so I saw that you went up to Ticonderoga last October did. and experienced did. The, the tour up there. So tell us about that. Oh, it was wonderful. So I was actually going up for the Northeast Trek Convention in Albany. This was run by Jerry Silber and, and, and colleagues over there. And as soon as I heard I was going to Albany, I, I realized, oh, that's near that Trek Museum. So I wrote to a friend of mine from college. Her name is uh, Dr. Jen Meekins. And asked her if she wanted to meet up with me at the convention and also to go to that museum. And we did it. We drove up the, the two hours from Albany to Ticonderoga. It was fantastic. I really, really, really enjoyed it. It was just, it was, it was like being in the Enterprise. It was just so realistic in so many different ways. You could see how they made the visual effects in different places. Going out there and setting foot on the bridge. Oh, it was, it was just fantastic. I, I just had a blast. What I always find, and this is very personal to me, I realize, but what, what I always find very odd is for me, I, I grew up in New York City and, mm-hmm. and my family had a little tiny speck of land in rural, very far upstate New York okay, uh, in cow country, uh, not too far from Ticonderoga and Saratoga right. Springs, but it was, it really was cow country. Mm-hmm. And, and so my whole perception in my head of that whole part of the state is literally hills and cows, <laughs> which, which was true. You know, so this is Washington County, New York state. If anybody's interested in looking it up and Washington County is entirely rural and, and Ticonderoga is right there. And when I think about like a Star Trek set tour right in the middle of that, I think I, I just, I, cause I've not ever been, so I can't reconcile these two things in my head. You know, I, I always sort of seize up when I think about it. Um, but I should advise if anybody's going to go, make sure you make a reservation online because I remember we went, we had a four o'clock reservation, but we were driving two hours to get there. And I think they had, they had four o'clock, they had like an hourly slot. They had a three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock. We got there at three 30. There was clearly nobody else there <laughs> besides the people running it. So they said, Oh, come on in. We did the tour. We finished at four 30. As we walked out, they all walked out and turned off the lights. <laughs> so it's, it's, it seems like it's a little bit of a mom and pop sort of operation. So I, I would definitely advise people to make a reservation just to, so you don't show up there and there's nobody there. <laughs> wow. So not something you should do casually. No. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Fantastic. Well, I did ask the M5 to prepare a dossier on you and uh, sure. it gave me a list of episodes. And I think I'm going to go out of order because we've already been talking about Tuvix. Yes. So I want to ask you about this. First of all, just from my perspective as someone who maybe is science friendly but doesn't know much about it, mm-hmm. <laughs> especially mm-hmm. biology, I'm I'm more into the physics and chemistry and, and earth science type stuff. It seemed to me that stepping into a transporter and actually having it meld two beings together <laughs> into something that actually lives. Uh, seems to me about as likely as walking into a football field with a blindfold, sticking a needle down and having it like pince an ant, you know, it's just oh, yeah. highly, highly, highly impossible. Yeah, no, it, what, what they said to the EMH had a quote on there, like my scans indicate all biological matter was merged on a molecular level, proteins, enzymes, DNA sequences. I remember when he said that I was thinking like, what the heck does that mean? Are like all the proteins twice as big now? What? <laughs> how how could that possibly be true? I don't even. It's not even that I don't know how it would work. I don't even know what that could possibly mean. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> is every other DNA nucleotide from one versus the other, or or does he have four copies of the genome or instead of having two? Like normally, people have one copy they get from their mom, one copy they get from their dad. Does 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 two Vicks have four? I mean, but that wouldn't affect the proteins or enzymes. That would just be ah. Oh, there's just so many questions. <laughs> Right off the bat. But let me ask you a question right off the bat. Sure. Uh, even, be- even before the science part, do you remember what happened right before it where um, there was some problem, as always, with that uh, molecular imaging scanners? Yes. And, and Harry Kim was like, oh, just try narrowing the annular confinement beam or, or whatever it is that they do. And they tried it. It's like, all right, now let's beam up the people. You yeah. think <laughs> if there was a glitch, <laughs> you would do some little test first. <laughs> so my my only I just immediately tried on the crew. <laughs> yeah, my my only analog to this is 
and I can't, I don't know if I've talked about this in the podcast before, but when I was a younger person and I was in school, I ran out of uh-huh. money at one point. And so I said, well, I need to finish college, but I don't have money. And I didn't want to ask my parents for more money. So I decided to do the most insane thing possible. And I went and I joined the Navy mm. and I became a nuclear reactor operator on a fast attack submarine of all things. Mm-hmm. And so, thank you for your service. oh, okay, well, thank you. But, uh, you should thank people that did like the really dangerous stuff. I worked in an engine room. My, the most danger I faced was getting hurt <laughs> by equipment. <laughs> um, you know, uh, and so anyway, neither here nor there, but the one thing I did learn from operating a very large, very complicated piece of technical equipment mm-hmm. is that a safety mindset is something that they beat into your head. Yes. <laughs> uh, like right from the beginning, like you don't ever see an anomaly in the panel and just go, what was that? Huh? Never mind. Let's move on. I mean, that's just, <laughs> that's just not what we do. You know, yes, if, if you see even one thing that doesn't look right, you have it investigated. Yes. And, and so yep. when I see stuff like that in Star Trek, I will admit it does bother me Yeah, because yep. I think, you know, I don't care 24th century technology, right? It, yeah. you know, you, you don't put people's lives on the line. Exactly. Just, exactly. you know, I don't know what that weird thing was. Let's, let's just go let's for just it. Try it on the crew. We're yeah. not going to beam up just a box first or yeah, something like that to make sure it's okay. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're not under time pressure. We have a, you know, docking bay full of shuttlecraft, but you know, the heck with that, Whatever. you know, it's just <laughs> that that's the kind of stuff that see, there are things that I know that they do in the show because they have to produce an episode in 44 okay. minutes yeah, or there's other reasons for doing things like that. Mm-hmm. But when there's things that happen in an episode that like it wouldn't have cost them any money and it wouldn't have thrown the production of the show out the window. Yeah. And they don't fix those things. That drives yeah. me berserk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can't remember if it was that episode, but there's another episode where Janeway says something like, I want to report on my desk at 600 hours. And I was like, what the hell is 600 hours? That doesn't exist. Did she mean, oh, 600 hours? Because if yeah. you say you want to report on my desk in 600 hours, that's 24 days from now. <laughs> that's <laughs> probably not what she wanted. <laughs> you know? and, and that's just something that slipped through and was a yeah. mistake. And people say, oh, well, that's a nit, right? I, I know that yeah. there's people like, well, you're nitpicking. And I think, mm-hmm. no, they see, that's just, that's a mistake that someone should have caught and it wouldn't have hurt anything to get it yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. I kind of have my own reaction to these things and I try to get over myself and not, you know, get, yeah. get spun up about it. And I'll admit there are some episodes where I'm just so enthralled with one of the performances or something that I'm willing to forgive a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's fair. It's fair. It's fair. Uh, um, I just, sure. you know, finished watching the episode. Oh, gosh, I'm not good with episode titles, but it's the one in Voyager where they find these two Ferengi have, um, you know, oh, laid yes. on the planet. <laughs> yeah, I love that episode. And it has I love anything with the Ferengi. Yeah, it, well, it has Michael Enzen in it, who I just yeah. find the most delightful. Thing. And even though he doesn't have a big part, he's just so mm-hmm. delightful in like the five minutes he's in the episode that I just mm-hmm. loved it because he was in it. And I'm willing to yeah. forgive a lot of other stuff. Was he the same actor who was in the same in the parallel episode in the Next Generation? No, 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 no. Okay. He was he wasn't one of the Ferengi. Oh, he wasn't one of the Ferengi. Oh, okay, sorry. He's he's the 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 bard who's on the planet oh, with the eye patch, and he's like, "Oh I my eye! Yeah, I please see, okay. give me ten francs for my eye." And they're God. like, "No, wasn't that eye patch on the other eye this morning?" He's like, "Oh," and he moves <laughs> it. Over. Really switch? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh my god, <laughs> he's so. I mean, the actor is just so delightful that you know it just brought a big smile to my face, and I was like, "I don't care about right. anything else in this episode. I love it." You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's great. So, oh man, well, uh, back to Tuvix. Yeah, I mean, the one thing that that could work there, which obviously is not what happened. There are, there are things in, in, uh, in biology, and this is known especially from plants, but it happens sometimes in animals. There's this process called allopolyploidy. This is what happens when two species, two different species, hybridize. So this would mean they actually, it, this would require like mating. So it would require gametes from one and gametes from the other. And normally, like I said, you get one set of all your genes from your mom, one set of all your genes from your dad. But every now and then something happens where you get both from both parents and the, and the offspring does actually have four copies and it effectively is a new species that actually is known to happen in plants. And a lot of the crops that we use are things that are allopolyploids. Now this doesn't happen That's, with humans. No, no, it does not happen with you. It does not happen with mammals <laughs> for sure. There are some frogs that are known to be allopolyploid, but not, not, uh, not human. There's definitely some fish as well. That is not, terribly different from what was depicted in terms of two weeks you could imagine the possibility that you know if let's say either tuvok or neelix was was a female and and the two of them had kids and maybe there was an allopolyploid event you could get something like tuvix and interestingly 
those kinds of hybrids tend to be much healthier than just regular, like one copy from one species, one copy from other species hybrids. So in that sense, you know, it's not so far off. I mean, the, the explanation they used in the episode was very different. They talked about symbiogenesis, which didn't really make any sense at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's a made up word. Is that what you're No, it's a, it's a real word. Oh, it's a real, it's a real word. Okay. It's a real word, but they, they didn't use it right at all. <laughs> Let me ask you something at the risk of perhaps being controversial. We can go as oh, far fair. with it as you want to go. Sure. Are transporters murder machines? <laughs> that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, obviously you're thinking in the context of, uh, is, does this person actually cease to exist? Is the, is the newly formed one, the same person? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, I guess if I had to, if I had to pick, I mean, I guess it comes down to the question of whether you believe in a soul, right. And whether the soul is somehow moving along with the, the energy bits. <sighs> so let, let, I, me, I, let me give you some background on why I've been asking this question at this point. Sure, um, sure, you know, I just came back from a vacation and one of the things yeah. I do on vacation I, is I try to catch up on my reading. So I read your book mm -hmm. on vacation yep. and, and I read another book, which is free online, by the way, I'll, I'll put a link up to this in the show notes. It's called mind body problems. Mm -hmm. And the whole point of the book is they take the, the author, he takes seven or eight people from different disciplines. And he asked them basically about this idea of free will and is, are we biologically determined and, you know, what, all of that. And so uh -huh. there's one school of thought that was in this book that says, no, we are entirely deterministic. You don't make any choice to pick up your water glass and drink it. By the mm -hmm. time you're aware of the choice, it's already happened. You know, your, your mm -hmm. hand is already moving. And okay. so your, your body is entirely deterministic and there is no free will. Mm -hmm. And there are some people who will beat you up if you tell them otherwise, mm -hmm. like an intellectual who's in that space would be Sam Harris, for instance, who listeners might be familiar with. And so, okay, fine. On an earlier edition of track profiles, I had on Dr. Ethan Siegel, uh, the physicist, mm -hmm. and he was very clear that, that quantum physics tells us the universe is not deterministic. Mm -hmm. And so if the universe is not deterministic, you have to reconcile that some people, not everybody, but some people are saying, well, humans are totally deterministic living in a non-deterministic universe, which I can't get my brain wrapped around that at all. So, yeah. and then you bring transporters into the mix where you're saying, we're going to somehow quantify a person yeah. and move it to another location. Yeah, I, I find the whole thing just mind blowing to think about. And I was just curious yeah. to your take on it. No, I, I honestly, I was trying to, I was trying to make a take on it, but I don't think I could even make a call one way or the other. <laughs> I'm trying to understand the comment you made though, about how it's not, I mean, at a quantum level, that's just, we're not deterministic. I, I, I see that that is in the context of being not predictable, but I don't necessarily see that that means that we're not a, that basically our actions are not dictated as though we're essentially just very complicated computer programs and we're just following the instructions that are there. I don't think those two things are contradictory. Oh, fair enough. Right. Fair enough. Right. It just mean, like, in the sense we're not deterministic in the sense you can't absolutely predict what the next thing is going to be. But that just means there's a random element in the program. It doesn't necessarily mean there's any free will or choice uh, involved in that. Uh, so you're, you're in that there's a middle school that says a little bit of both. That, that's well, I'm, not, I'm, I'm actually arguing that potentially there's no free will <laughs> is what I'm potentially arguing here. But what's happening is there's a computer program and there's just a random element. And then the random element is what's going on in terms of the lack of determinism. You see what I mean? Well, okay. And then that random element then would have to be quantized yes. and then sent to another location yes, in a transporter. And would it be yeah. the same? And so would that be the same element? Does always say it doesn't, no, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter because it's random. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, right. I mean, basically if the computer program is moving and you still have the same program and it still has the same uh, random generator in there, would you get the same numbers there as before? It doesn't really matter one way or the other because the numbers were unpredictable anyway. Okay, well, then let me ask you this, because I, I want to bring up then Nemesis. Okay. And I want to talk about the, the Picard cloning, because uh, you Absolutely. talk about this in your book, right? Yep. And you make a distinction. And let me tell you at least my understanding of it, which I'm sure is wrong, so you can correct me on it, is you talk about the difference between DNA and then you talk about RNA. Yes. And they make a big deal in the movie about RNA. And, That's right, temporal RNA sequencing. <laughs> right. And if I understood your book, which I'm sure I did not, so I, I look forward to getting the, <laughs> the correct answer from you, <laughs> is, that, is that even if you copy someone's DNA, that doesn't necessarily give you that exact person because there are different sequences which could be activated as that person develops. That's correct. And so even if I had Picard's DNA, That's correct. It, the movie has a conception that there is, there's a nature versus nurture and there mm -hmm. is no nature difference between Picard and Shinzon. And Shinzon mm -hmm. hits this many times. So, you know, if you had had the life I'd had, you would be me. 
Mm-hmm. And if I understood your book correctly, you're saying, no, that's not even possible that you're the. Well, not, not exactly. So, I mean, I guess you could say that the, the, which, the decision of which genes are turned on could be a, a product of nurture, right? So the nature is still the DNA piece. But so this is tricky. When people say nurture, you often think in the context of like a mother nurturing their kid or something like that. But there are, we do respond to our environment and our environment can be, you know, just really random stuff. Like it can be things like how much sunlight you get, how much, you know, how old you are. All these different things will, will change which genes are turned on in your body. So he grew right. up in the mines of Remus, yes. which would obviously. So clearly he was in a radically different environment. Now, it's quite possible if Picard, if you took that original embryo Picard and put him over there, he may have been the same. Though we know that we know from the plot of the movie that wouldn't be the case just because there was all that the acceleration stuff that they had done by that temporal sequencing. That, that clearly would be different because you know, presumably that didn't happen with Picard. But if, let's say that a Picard embryo went to the mines and the Shinzon embryo went to the mines, it, they may be. They may be exactly the same in terms of the the genetic code. And at that point, they would also have the same environment. Now, there's going to be small elements just in the context of who they interact with, how they interact. Because obviously, you can't have exactly the same environment. Even identical twins don't have exactly the same environment because obviously they're interacting with different people. And, you know, somebody stubs this toe, somebody eats this different thing. So there's there's always going to be little subtle things in there, which will which will cause some differences to appear. And there's no two individuals who or there's no even two cells that have exactly the same DNA code, even too. even within our own bodies. We often talk about the, the DNA sequence of an individual, but in fact, every cell in your body doesn't have exactly the same DNA sequence because there are mutations that happen during cell division in every, gener- in every cell division. So let, let me indulge my, my own curiosity here. So Please. I did one of those uh, spit tube DNA tests. Yep. So yep. If, if I had done it on a Wednesday instead of a Tuesday, I may have gotten some different results. <laughs> those, they don't look at that many uh, sites with that. So when you do the spit tube thing, they're looking at somewhere on the order of like half a million different spots in the genome. The genome has 3.1 billion and you have two different copies of it. So probabilistically, if you did that and then did it again, say a couple of years later, it would all be the same, or maybe one might be different, but yeah. <laughs> okay. So, th- but if you did the whole genome, if you look at all three point one billion, and let's say you use like you know the tip of your pinky and the tip of your other pinky, <laughs> they wouldn't be exactly the same. They'd be close. They'd be much more similar to each other than they are to any cell from any other person anywhere in the world by far. But you would find like a couple of differences among those three point one billion sites. Let me theorize with you about something that's bugged me a little bit sure. about. Star Trek. And this is, again, my own uh, just thinking about how the future might be. In a lot of science fiction, we see different takes on what the future might look like. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, if you want like the Aldous Huxley Brave New World point of view Mm -hmm. where, you know, everybody's grown in a lab dish and, you know, they're sort of designed to be a certain kind of person. You know, you have the alphas and the betas and and all Mm -hmm. that. Now, mm-hmm. as we speak, there's a lot of excitement and energy about, about CRISPR-Cas9, which is this technology yes. that allows us to do things to DNA. Mm-hmm. As we record this, there's this big story about this thing happening in China, which I'd love to get your opinion on that, or what you think that is, and if it really happened or not. It seems that there's a controversy about that. When I think about the Star Trek future uh, with the technology they have, I get that there is a strong prohibition and moral prohibition against eugenics based on yes. the human history. So I, I get that. Yeah. So I understand what yeah. that they're not, you know, whipping up babies in test tubes. Right. So yeah. I'm totally okay with that, but yeah. I can't imagine that they would just be randomly selecting mates given the technology that they have. I, I sort of envision yeah. it would be like it is in the movie Gattaca. If you'd seen that yeah. where people are, you know, profiling their DNA against potential mates and then like mm. selecting the best parts of themselves, you know, and yeah. I, I just, I can't imagine that they wouldn't be doing that. Yeah, it is hard to imagine that that wouldn't be happening. And, and to some extent, you know, you can imagine, in a, you know, the, it sounds like ominous when you think about it in the context of Gattaca, but imagine the sense of, imagine, you know, that you're a carrier for disease and you know somebody else is a carrier for disease. Do you really want to have kids with that person and have a one in four shot that that person would have the, the disease? You might, that might actually be a non-starter. That might make you say, you know what, I'd rather go with somebody else or not have kids with this person. Yeah, no, I agree. And I agree. Given the status of medical technology that we see in Star Trek time, I mean, they would 100% oh, yeah. absolutely be able to do that, right? And be like, yeah, edit, oh, yeah. edit, edit that oh, out. Yeah. Oh, sickle cell anemia, edit that out, you know? Yeah, uh, you know, heart yeah. arrhythmia, yeah, let's get rid of that, you know? Oh, so there's getting rid of it and there's avoiding the mate that has it, right? So those are two different things. <laughs> so avoiding the mate who has it, that becomes like an individual decision. And, and I don't think there's any ethical qualms to it. But going in and actually 
erasing a disease. It's, it's very hard to know where you draw the line on those sorts of genetic manipulation. So this comes back, like you said, to the, the recent uh, uh, Chinese scientist who says that they've uh, engineered a baby who is uh, basically more resistant to HIV. And I think, I think that one of the parents, I can't remember if it was the mother or the father, one of, the other, one of them has HIV, it was HIV positive. It sounds non-controversial on some level to say like, okay, let's get rid of sickle cell anemia because obviously it's a bad disease. Let's make sure that our kid doesn't have it. So we'll just edit out that mutation. On the one hand, that sounds good. But on the other hand, like, where do you draw the line? I say, okay, sickle cell anemia is a deadly disease. Okay, what about something a little bit less deadly? What about, you know, predisposition to getting Lyme disease when exposed to ticks? What about being not attractive, <laughs> you know? It's very fuzzy where you draw that absolute line there. And this is the thing that, that there needs to be a general conversation about within our society. Like, if we're going to let this happen, where is it okay and where is it not okay to happen? I think controlled breeding in the sense of if it's, if it's an individual decision is fine. And I don't think anybody would have any qualms with that. Like, if I knew I was a carrier for some, let's say, Huntington's disease or something like that, and I knew mm -hmm. somebody else would, you know, my choosing not to have a kid with that person, would, I don't think anybody would think that's a problem. But going in there and manipulating the DNA sequence to do it, uh, that's a little bit more iffy. And even something like sickle cell anemia, that's, that's a, it's interesting you pick that particular example. That disease persists because individuals who are carriers for it actually have a fitness advantage in some environments. Humans who, are, who, are, who have one copy are actually less susceptible to malaria. Right, which is it's why it's um, really advantageous it's so in the abundant. tropics, right? Exactly, exactly. So let's say, for example, we went through there and, and we deleted that out there on the one hand we get rid of the people who have the debilitating disease but on the other hand now the susceptibility of malaria has gone away so there, there's all these ethical qualms in the sense of like well maybe there's going to be something else when we manipulate the gene pool are we going to have these unintended consequences i mean i have a personal opinion about what i think should be done in this regard but this is not something that i Muhammad Noor, <laughs> should be making the decision about this needs to be something that there's a much much broader group of ethicists and, and lawyers and everybody just contributing to it well, I, you know, I think you're actually bringing up something which is very important to contemplate in, in modern society, right? Which is we have a lot yeah. of people who are, yeah. who are technical experts in lots of fields mm -hmm. who are making advances and doing things who are not necessarily trained or equipped or even incented to think about the ethical implications of what they're doing. Absolutely right. Right. Absolutely I mean, this right. is what we see in, in a lot of the, the news coverage around Facebook and social media, mm -hmm. you know, is like, mm -hmm. oh, they're just trying to make a product. Right. But in fact, yep. it's harmful. Some people are saying, you know, and there's lots of different points of view on it. I'm not trying to pick a personal point of view on it, but of course uh, we can certainly see that in the news. And they're like, well, are you even equipped to deal with this? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. It's true. It is interesting how with Star Trek, they basically just say that they don't allow any sort of manipulation. It's kind of interesting that regard, but given, for example, the reaction to Julian Bashir being you know, genetically enhanced that that's that's interesting that that was the way they went the, you know that they decided this was just bad and just generally speaking the, the depictions in star trek of any sort of genetic enhancements is, is very negative i mean you think about khan or or uh or the people called from enterprise the um the augments the augments yes the, the augments from enterprise i mean again it was depicted very critically and even with uh, julian Bashir, i mean he was one successful case but we saw in the episodes that had him a whole bunch of other ones uh, that had you know personality quirks and other sorts of issues yeah the patients yeah. yeah 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 collectively I mean, that group mm -hmm. generally speaking it seems like there's a lot of fear of genetics in, in a lot of star trek i mean to think about it in this in this sense how many positive role models are there of engineers in star trek and how many negative i mean there's, you know, a lot of positive. There's a few negative. How many positive role models are there of geneticists in Star Trek? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> there's only one. Only one. And that's the original Carol Marcus from Wrath of Khan, who then, of course, when Into Darkness came, they're like, yeah, get rid of that. We'll make her an engineer. <laughs> right, 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 right. Anytime they really get into that sort of using science to do something really big. It, yeah. it never really works out well in Star Trek, like That's the Genesis right. device, right? Doesn't work That's out right. well. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, we, we've been talking about a couple different issues here, and I, I want to bring up an, another issue uh, that relates to another episode that the M5 uh, selected for us, which is the, ch sure. the chase, this TNG episode. Oh, yeah. So why don't we start with a discussion of one of the topics that you mentioned in your book, which is panspermia, yeah. which is this idea yeah. that, that, that life was influenced by some things that happened in space, if I understood it correctly. Yeah. That's correct. So why don't you give us a little view of that sure. and then tell us what you think about the chase, this idea that all these sure. quote unquote humanoids uh, are somehow Absolutely. related across Star Trek. Absolutely. So, I mean, this, the, the simplest version of panspermia is that the first life on Earth came from outer space, you know, maybe in a meteorite, you know, embedded in it or something like that. 
that is not, I mean, that's quite possible. I mean, we, we don't really know. I mean, we know there are extraterrestrially formed amino acids. We know there's components of DNA or RNA that are found in meteorites. So, yeah, I mean, the idea that maybe either the first life or some components for life came from outer space, there's nothing controversial to that at all. And that's at least implied in what's said there in, at the end of the chase where our scientists seeded the primordial oceans of many worlds where life was in its infancy. I'm not sure exactly what they mean by what life was in its infancy. I mean, that could mean the raw materials were there. Or it could mean that there was just an original organism there. So that aspect to it is pretty good. And the timing they gave for it, where they say this was, this was all happening about 4 billion years in the episode, that's about right. That's about when life started here on Earth. And, you know, and I, I obviously don't know about Cardassia or Romulus. <laughs> when right, right, right. To have begun there, but yeah, you could imagine that that's, the, that, that that's possible. There's two big issues, well, one especially and another general, with the depiction there. So what they say after that is the seed codes directed your evolution toward a physical form resembling ours. So four billion years ago, those seed codes would have had to have led to something that is humanoid today or human today, actually, not even humanoid, but human today. And the same thing would have happened on Cardassia. The same thing would have happened on Romulus. I mean, there's a whole bunch of others, maybe Beta Z. I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure what all the ones that they were referring well, to were. It, it wouldn't we, have we been the, from Romulus. It would have been from Vulcan. Because remember, the, the oh, you're right, came you're right. from Vulcan. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So actually, there's some extra issues with the Vulcans. We'll come back to that. Remind me, though. Okay. <laughs> So the implication there is that and this comes back to what you had asked about earlier. The, the implication there is that this was very deterministic, that the outcome was predetermined that this was what was going to happen. That is almost certainly not true. There have been so many random events that played a major, major role in having humans on Earth today in the form that we have. So just as one example, 65 million years ago, there's a lot of volcanic activity and this big asteroid comes out of, out of uh, space, crashes into Earth. Those two things knock back the dinosaurs. Before that time, mammals existed. They were here on Earth, but they were, you know, these little tiny things cowering in, in fear of these giant dinosaurs that were going to eat them. By virtue of having that, that happen, we had the radiation of mammals, which ultimately then led to primates and humans coming out from that. So did those people aim asteroids at Vulcan and and Kronos and Romulus too, or <laughs> how did that not? I mean, there's a lot of other events too, and this is something Stephen Jay Gould, the, the evolutionary biologist, wrote about quite a bit. In the context of if you replay the tape of life, would you get the same outcome again? The answer is almost certainly not, because there's a lot of random events. There's a lot of things we know that were very very unlikely, but just happened to happen. And the odds of them happening here and on all those other different worlds, you know, 19 different worlds or whatever it was from that episode, it's incalculably rare or incalculably uh, un improbable the other thing is just how well the c codes would persist so when they were when they were looking at those in the episode they were looking at these dna fragments now they were using some weird terms they kept on saying connect the dna fragments according to their protein link compatibility i have no idea what that actually means <laughs> <laughs> but, like okay yeah, they, they may not have either they probably hey that sounds yeah. good string those words no, together. right exactly exactly <laughs> There's a lot of times in Star Trek in general where they'll just look at this DNA code like, oh, it's identical to yours, John Luke. Like, what? If you just look at it and tell that, how do you, <laughs> you have John Luke's sequence memorized? <laughs> don't, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> anyway, but um, if it's actually in the DNA sequence in the sense of the, you know, so DNA comes in, the, in four nucleotides, uh, A, C, G, and T are the abbreviations we use for them. If it was in that code, right? Let's say it was just part of that actual code, not something about the structure of DNA per se. We know of the mutation rate that happens, and this comes back to our discussion in terms of mutations too. We know that there's a mutation rate of say on the order of one times 10 to the minus ninth or one times 10 to the minus 10th changes per cell division or per generation. There is no way <laughs> that that code would persist over 4 billion years. So good that it can play this perfect video, <laughs> much less, much less actually result in a perfect humanoid. I mean, what's the difference between all the humanoids in Star Trek, right? When we look at, you know, the forehead ridges. Uh, say, uh, yeah, yeah, right. When I look at us versus, I mean, I'll, I'll use an extreme one. Look at humans versus betazoids. Yeah. <laughs> Dark eyes <laughs> and telepathy. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. And that, that's incalculably uncommon. And if you think about it, you're more closely related to grass than you are to a betazoid. Yet we're interfertile with betazoids. I'm assuming we're not interfertile with 
grass. <laughs> now, now that's interesting because that brings up what I thought was one of the more interesting episodes of, of Voyager that I had just watched, mm. which was Faces, mm-hmm. which is where uh, Torres is split apart into her yep. human and her Klingon yep. half. Klingon half. And, yep. and the whole idea that, okay, we've pretty much set up in the show that in the the world of Star Trek, right? And I don't think this is just the Federation. I think this is a lot of the species that were not big on genetic manipulation or anything like that. So any interspecies mating would have to be done just naturally. It doesn't seem like they're really going into the lab to to produce offspring. Well, there are, there was some, there was a comment like Kalar, Kalar, I forget how you say yep, her Yeah, Kalar. Yeah, she made a comment at one point about how um, it needed some help or something like that. And there's also a comment in, in um, Enterprise in E squared in that episode where that where somehow the doctor comes up with some way for Trip and to Paul to have a baby. So there's clearly some sort of manipulation happening there too, but I'm not sure what it is. I'm not sure if it's a fertilization issue or if it's something about actually the DNA not being or the chromosomes not being compatible. I'm not sure what the issue is because they're always a little cryptic about it. Oh, I didn't remember that. So it just seemed yeah. really odd to me that there's just a lot of, you know, when you look at all of Star Trek, I mean, you got Zial, you got Torres. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. just a lot of interspecies mating going on. Yeah. Deanna Troy, Spock. Yeah, <laughs> there's just a lot of it. And, and you know, they seem to have this very strong prohibition against medical help, but, um, you know, in that mm-hmm. ballpark. But it looks like they're certainly, you know, getting it done with the deed somehow. Somehow. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, very strange to me. But the, mm-hmm. the one thing that I thought was really interesting was this idea that they could somehow split apart Torres into her two halves, which... Uh, yeah, that's very problematic. <laughs> it's interesting. This is something that we're actually studying right now. I mean, not obviously with Klingons. <laughs> so we're actually studying right now in my research lab. But I don't know if you knew that most animals tend to carry, on average, one lethal, recessive lethal allele. That if you, if basically, if that's the only copy you have, you would actually die. Most individuals tend to have that. This is one of the reasons why inbreeding tends to be bad because in general, like you, for, you, for example, would have a particular gene which has a lethal variant, but you only have one copy and you need two copies to actually die. So you might have one, your spouse might have one, but odds are you and your spouse don't have the same one. So you can have kids together and it's fine. In contrast, if you had kids with your sister, she's more likely to have the same one and your kid's more likely to die or have some sort of you know problems. This is what actually causes inbreeding depression, right? Ah, I see. So if you split Taurus, then she's only going to have one copy. Right. Each of her halves is only going to have one copy. So those halves would probably be very sickly, if not dead. In my own head, I sort of compared it to taking a person and saying, I'm going to split you into your mother's part and your father's yeah, part. Exactly. It, it seemed like just a very half bizarre of your mother's. Yeah, it's only, only half of your mother, and only half of your father. That's what makes it the bad. Because Obviously, your mother's fine and your father's fine. But having only half your mother, then you're, you're not going to have the good copy to balance out the bad copy your mother had. Ah, I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. So I'm going to put that down as an episode where sacrifice was, uh, where science was sacrificed on the altar for uh, a beautiful episode, (laughs) uh, beautifully acted. And uh, the acting was wonderful. I still love the episode uh, despite that. Oh yeah. I I was, it was one of my favorites actually uh, watching all of, all of Voyager. But uh, another thing that struck me in Voyager was this whole idea of the Vidians and the phage uh, and harvesting organs from other being other species, no less. Uh, mm-hmm. and incorporating them into themselves, uh, which I thought was an mm-hmm. interesting question. So I wanted to ask you about that and mm-hmm. what, what your perspective was on that whole idea. So the phage, when they say phage, it's interesting is that there is something actually called a phage, and, and but it's not exactly what they're describing. So a phage is a virus which actually inserts its DNA, or sorry, it's, it's well, maybe it's DNA, I can't remember if it's DNA or RNA. It inserts its genetic code into a bacterium and basically takes it over and then makes the bacterium produce more of the virus. So this is obviously not that kind of phage, <laughs> which is affecting the. But somehow there's some disease which is going through, and it's specific in the sense that it's attacking the Vidian skin and, and organs, things like that. But it it's, must be very specific to the Vidians because it didn't seem like there was ever any concern of getting the quote unquote phage, like of, of like say the humans picking it up and all of a sudden having the same symptoms. That didn't that never seemed to come up, which I thought was kind of interesting. That whatever it is is very specific to those Vidians. Even though the Vidians, again, it looked pretty humanoid. It looked no more different from us than any others than any other Star Trek species. Yeah, especially when we got to see Dr. Pell in her exactly. natural state. I mean, she looked very, exactly. very humanoid. Exactly, exactly. But I guess it's not transmissible, well, uh, at least between species. <laughs> so that was interesting. I don't know of any any equivalent sorts of things where, you know, 
obviously where organs are taken, you know, in, in, in a real life animal species from one species to another, obviously like, you know, animals consume each other all the time. Sure. <laughs> That's not uncommon <laughs> or use things left over by them. You can think of just a simple example. Think of like hermit crabs. They're using stuff left over from other species. So cool. That's probably the closest I could think of to it. But yeah, it, it's an interesting, it was a very interesting idea. I, I thought the, the idea behind that was really cool. And it, and it, it was fascinating that it actually got solved too. That the Vidian phage, they actually got a cure eventually. Oh, nice. Well, I haven't got there yet. So thanks for the spoiler. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> that that's, it's it's only a passing comment. You never actually see the video. No, no, no. It's you know, it's fine. I, you know, I, uh, on Twitter, <laughs> I always post about comments about these episodes as I watch them. And then people like, oh, and I really like it when this thing happens seven episodes later. And I was like, ah, <laughs> you know, oh, no. <laughs> I, I don't get, I don't get too spun up about it. But I, oh, I you know, good. on Twitter, a lot of the, um, paraverbal communication is lost so when i say things like yeah. oh you spoiled it people think i'm mad or something and i'm not yeah, you yeah, know it's like yeah. totally <laughs> taken in stride because you know the one thing you've got to realize about most star trek except maybe discovery i think is that in a lot of cases they hit the reset button and forget about a lot of stuff that already happened so yeah. <laughs> you know there's not going to be any lasting effects which by the way is the one thing that also bugged me about tuvix is i wanted to see neelix go into a long deep dark depression yeah and realize oh. I was I was surprised there wasn't more follow up at the end of that episode about you know really sort of understanding what they remembered and how, how they uh, how would they would interpret this you know sharing from each other yeah it was it was interesting well I, that that you're, that which is also a good thing but I was thinking about it from the perspective that oh my gosh the captain murdered this other being so that I might live oh right I mean oh yeah that, that's, that's kind of a, that. that's kind of a tough thing to be living with and neelix seems like the kind of guy who, yeah. who might actually have some problems with it tuvok he would just yeah. throw some side eye and carry on but he, he <laughs> seems very you know sanguine about the whole thing no it's but, true no, 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 it is true that like neelix wouldn't be with kess and kess would be alone so that would probably be the, the one way that neelix would probably be able to live through it yeah it's true it's true Okay, yeah. I want to ask you a little bit about discovery because there's some great biology sure. stuff in there, and I think uh, the M5 <laughs> some not great biology too. Oh, oh okay, <laughs> uh, spoiler warning. So I, I think we'll probably do a twofer here. We want to talk about yeah. choose your pain and the episode that yeah. I personally called the writers care not for the length of the episode title, other, <laughs> otherwise known as the butcher's knife cares not for the lamb's cry. Okay. And it's really about what they call the tardigrade, which I don't yes. believe is actually a tardigrade by any means. It's just what they're calling no. it. It looks like one a little bit. It, yeah, it does. <laughs> it, it it has a resemblance, but it's not a tardigrade no. as you no. or I would would recognize it. It's just that's the term no. that they're using for it. Just like that yeah. being in uh, that original series episode, the giant space amoeba. It, yeah. it looks like a space <laughs> amoeba, but it's not any kind of amoeba, right? It's and in fairness, Burnham said that she said your ripper, your ripper appears to share some traits with the tardigrade species. You know, so they said it that at first, but then after that, it just became the tardigrade. <laughs> right. So we talked about this idea of panspermia, which is the life coming from space. So, so there's life out there. So why can't there be spores out there and be part of the mycelial network that we can use to travel <laughs> oh around the universe? <laughs> sounds cool to me. Uh, it sounds cool. This is one of those, again, uh, you know, where do you start uh, sorts of questions? <laughs> So, I mean, the simplest level, one of the biggest issues with in terms of the mycelia network is they say that these mycelia extend everywhere in the universe. The universe is really big, just in Earth's orbit. We're not talking about everywhere in the solar system. We're not talking about everywhere in the galaxy. We're talking about the universe. That's a heck of a lot of spores. Where on Earth did all those spores come from? <laughs> it's just inconceivable. So the species they talk about, the Prototexide Stellar Viatori, that's an ancient species that, that we know was on Earth. There's fossils of it here on Earth. It's hard to imagine how you could get, or it's not hard to imagine, it's just flat impossible, <laughs> how you could get so many spores, they would be everywhere. Now, there's a lot of discussion in the episode, which makes it very hard to understand exactly what's going on. There's like it's part of a subspace network. Well, I, I don't know what subspace is. So <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe subspace has like different dimensions in the regular space. So you can have a lot fewer and they go a lot further. Maybe. I mean, I'm making this up. Of course, I'm not a physicist. This is where Dr. Aaron McDonald, one of your previous guests, would have better insights than me. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just I cannot imagine how that would work. I cannot imagine how you could have spores that are that abundant that aren't, you know, it's, I mean, just think of the number of spores that would take. It's just incalculable. And then that doesn't even broach the question of how are you using them as a means for transportation? 
I will say that I, I heard an interview on another podcast with the with the real live Dr. Stamets. And yes. and I uh, I've made reference to this in the podcast before. Yes. And I will just say that he's a really visionary type guy. And he, yeah, he is that a, a big thinker type <laughs> dude, you know, and I could easily see how after the writers, because I, I know that they've talked about this, that the writers got on the phone with him for a few hours. Oh, yeah. And I could easily see how after getting off the phone with him for a few hours, they, their minds were just blown and they're like going yes. 17 kinds of directions with what they could do with. This. Oh, we know. So, that's, we know that's the case, because if you look at his TED talk. Shortly after his TED talk, Brian Fuller tweeted about it. <laughs> this was many years before Discovery. So clearly he was influenced by this. <laughs> There's no doubt. We know that, that he had a big influence on them, mm-hmm. of course, and they, they mm-hmm. named the scientist on Discovery after him. So the exomycologist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, you know, which is great, right? You know, yeah. <laughs> I studied yeah. outer space fungus. But yeah. before the show came out, I kept thinking, man, that's weird. You know, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, you know, normally there's sort of these more it's specific. Yeah, they're, they're, they're sort of like these more general science officer types. Here we're going to a guy who studies extraterrestrial fungus. So like that is oddly specific. <sighs> but, you know, it came so, out. So I can imagine fungal spores now in defense. I, I was you know, I was mocking the, the the extent of the network in their defense. Yes, fungal spores are very resilient. It is possible that fungal spores could survive, you know, in space like conditions, at least for some length of time, probably better than than most organisms could. I mean, spores in general, probably if we had things that are actually going from Earth into space, that's probably the way they would go in which they, they wouldn't just immediately die. So that aspect too is good. It's just the extent of it saying they're everywhere in the universe and then apparently in, in, even in different universes too, because we see the mirror universe too, that, that just gets into the completely absurd, not thinking in the context of how big the universe really is. Understanding how big space is, is something that I, I do appreciate. And it's one of yeah. the things that kind of bugs me a little bit in Star Trek when we keep running into the same people. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, oh, we've, we've run into, you know, the Romulan Tomalak again mm-hmm. in TNG. We run into him like every year. It's like, I thought yeah. space is big. You know, running into yeah. anybody would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> running into anybody would be amazing. Running into the same guy again and again. Yeah. That's weird. <laughs> but it's interesting, too. Somebody pointed out to me at one point in time, why don't ships ever come at each other in completely different angles? But they always have the sort of the same top bottom orientation relative to each other. Sure. You know, that's that's something where I just rack that up to it's the effects budget. And, you know, it's one of these yeah. things where then they have to try to explain it. Yeah, so I was listening to a, another interview with with an actor that had nothing to do with anything to do with Star Trek. And he was talking about a movie scene where they come across a character who froze to death. So, he's mm-hmm. you know, imagine like the Arctic or something. Okay. And the thing is, the character was in their coat, you know, and they have all these blankets wrapped around mm-hmm. them and they're in the corner and they look like they're shivering and they were frozen to death like that. Okay. And I think it's been like that in an original series. I remember that. Yeah, if they froze to death, right? But but yeah. apparently in reality, that's not what happens. Mm-hmm. Because when someone is freezing to death, at the last minute their body releases all the blood from the core as it starts to die. Mm-hmm. And all of mm-hmm. a sudden they feel hot. And so people who freeze to death are sometimes found disrobed oh wow but then you have to have some idiot character say why is he naked well because of this reason (laughs) you know and so it's one of these things where like even if you know the right answer you don't necessarily want to do it because then you have to spend minutes explaining it in the context of the show and Mm, you're not driving your plot anywhere so i totally get that that's fair that's you know if you're writing an epic tome you can have those diversions but when you got to get your story done in 44 minutes or something it's Mm -hmm. probably a whole different game i I give them i totally think it's fair i I give them all kinds of credit for that yeah yeah. one thing i don't give them credit for is when they take ethical shortcuts and Mm. i found one of those in the episode i I almost hesitate to bring it up because i can hear the groans of people for having me bring this up but (laughs) threshold well you 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 got it you got it in one right so how in the world is our future dna encoded into our present body that's that's obviously not correct and i don't think i have to be any kind of biologist to figure that one out no that's right (laughs) but the part that really got me is how Harris has it, but then Janeway has the exact same code such that in billions of years in the future, they're able to mate with each other. Yeah, this is a this is a general problem with a lot of science fiction is this idea that mutations are somehow directed and like can work with each other in the same body. So if 
let's say, for example, somebody was exposed to something which caused a lot of mutations. So let's say, you know, this actually happens in real life. Like when you're outside and you're in the sun and you're actually causing some DNA damage to your, to your skin cells, what's the outcome of that? The outcome of that, you know, is, you know, well, obviously you get a tan, but that's not the damage part. But the most out- like, yeah, outcome of that is skin cancer. <laughs> that is not the cells working well together to form a new organism or anything like that. The most likely thing is just, you know, you screw things up. The, the analogy I use in my classes when I'm talking about mutations having a random effect, we have a body, you know, and a genetic code associated with this body that's been evolving for 4 billion years, right? Mm-hmm. If you were to make a random change, it's like getting a Lexus and standing really far away from it with a hammer and throwing the hammer at it, what is the probability that you will make it better? <laughs> it's not actually zero, but it's pretty darn close to zero. <laughs> That's why mutations are way more likely to have no effect than, than this an- analogy might be that you missed or you just happened to hit it in such a way it didn't really do anything. Or you're going to make it a lot worse. <laughs> I'm rapidly running out of my knowledge here, but please, so please correct me on this. But my understanding is this whole idea of epigenetics is that that there's yes. different parts of our of our DNA that are that are activated at certain times yes. and in certain places. Yeah. So even if Paris and Janeway were in this situation, just the epigenetic factors would cause things to happen very differently, right? In addition yes. to the effect that well, you described. The epigenetic, so so people use epigenetics in different in different uh, contexts. So I'm going to use it just in the context of basically which genes are turned on and how much they're turned on. That it's pretty often that the that cells will respond similarly in that context. Not not perfectly the same, but like let's say if one individual and another individual, they would probably have similar sorts of responses to a particular environmental stimulus. So that actually makes it maybe a tiny bit better. Now the odds of any sort of epigenetic thing making you turn into an amphibian is ridiculous. Like that would never happen because there's no code in your DNA sequence to make you into a you know human sized amphibian <laughs> that, that, that does not exist in our genetic code. It doesn't matter which genes you turn on or off or modulate how much they're turned on. That would never happen. But that aspect's a little bit better than just straight up mutations. Now, in the episode, they actually did say it was straight up mutations. They, of course, didn't reference epigenetics. And although the term epigenetics wasn't really popular back then. This turning on or off of DNA certainly was very well known in the, in the 1990s so that there was opportunity to. to have that a little bit closer but yeah i i don't think epigenetics saves it in this case it's a little bit better but only a little bit better i, I realize that listeners might might feel that we're beating up on star trek with with a lot of these yeah. discussions and i just want to be clear that that we're not we love star trek in in spite absolutely. of these things right <laughs> absolutely absolutely it's good to, it's good to point that out and honestly there are aspects of which we're which are you know in some sense good because they are actually introducing this idea of mutations things like this. so there's some positive elements to it I guess Threshold doesn't have as many positive elements as some of the other episodes do. <laughs> Given the understanding that I got from your book about the biology and Threshold, I mean, the, the part of mm-hmm. the episode that actually really bothered me wasn't so much the science. It was the fact that they left their slug babies behind. <laughs> yeah, yep, I'm yep. a parent. I, I don't care if I had a slug baby. It's my slug baby. And not only that, the, the whole idea of Starfleet is to go out and find new life and all that, yeah. right? New new life, new civilization. Well, there it was. We're going to leave it on the planet. I don't think they even really studied it, or at least we didn't see it. them try to study it. No, they just <laughs> they left like them just behind. Just, yeah. Yeah, just flew off. Now, there are aspects that are pretty good. So coming back to the previous episode you were just talking about with, with, with respect to the spore network, we didn't really mention the tardigrade. The tardigrade aspect, it was interesting they brought that up. And that actually, I'd say there's some very positive elements there because they actually referred to a scientific study that was published just a few years ago indirectly. So Michael Burnham, in studying it, said, and I have, a, I have it written right here, enter the tardigrade whose unique genetic makeup allows it to navigate through the network because of its symbiotic relationship with mycelium spores. That's not the important part. It's the next sense. Like its microscopic cousins on Earth, the tardigrade is able to incorporate foreign DNA into its own genome via horizontal gene transfer. Now, it's interesting because I think around 2015 or so, there was a study published by some researchers at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. They had just obtained the first full genome sequence of the tardigrade and assembled it. And they found a lot of what appeared to be horizontal gene transfer into the genome. So the, the tardigrade seemed to have DNA from all these other different species in it. Something I think they estimated like 16% of its genome was from other species. That was really dramatic. That's amazing. That got a lot. Yeah, right? That was really dramatic. It got a lot of press publicity. And I'm sure that's what the writers picked up on. So... That was a positive. The twist is the next year, some people studied it a little bit further and they figured out that there was a mistake. Oh, no. <laughs> of course, in defense of the writers, the, the mistake aspect 
didn't get nearly the same sort of publicity. <laughs> it, it never <laughs> yeah. does. It never does. It never does. Now, of, of course, if they consulted with, like, I don't work on tardigrades, but I knew very well about the study and that it had been taken back. But <laughs> the writers clearly then didn't reach out to geneticists to check on this. Fair enough. I mean, I understand they're under time constraints. They're just using what they have and they just want to run with it. But it still was interesting. They introduced this idea of horizontal gene transfer and the graphic they showed in that episode was great. I actually totally want to steal that and use that the next time I'm actually lecturing about this in my uh, undergraduate courses. Now, do, do you actually use Star Trek in any of your courses? I have not so far done so in my regular classes. However, there's two places where I, I well, one where I have and one where I will. In the past, I've taught a spring break class here at Duke. So these are classes that are just you know over the week of spring break. I teach you again with my colleague, Professor Eric Spana, who's the one who I mentioned who does the genetics of wizarding and Harry Potter talks. We do this one called the biology behind popular science fiction TV and movies. And the idea there is to introduce some basic biological concepts, but in a way it's going to be a lot more fun and interesting for the students than just like, let's memorize the next step of the Krebs cycle now and things like that. So we have them explore questions. Like one of the things Eric Spano likes to ask them is like, why do we not see more blue species out there? Like look at what produces blue and try to explain why you don't see more of that. And then, you know, contrasting it, say to a mystique, you know, right, from, right, right. Uh, it, yeah. uh, from the Marvel universe. Exactly. Exactly. And I do the same sort of thing with, with Star Trek and we, we, we have a lot of fun with that. And, and it really, gives the students a chance to sort of mix some um, both creativity and learning and have them, you know, delve into the research and try to understand what's going on. And it, it's, it's a lot more interesting than again, like memorizing things, which is what often happens next semester. So this is spring 2019. I'm going to be teaching a class on genetics, evolution, Star Trek. And I'll be actually using the book that you, that you've been reading as the textbook, as well as a whole bunch of supplementary readings from the actual scientific literature. So I'm very excited about that. And I think it's, I think, it's going to be pretty fun. The students have already signed up. Interestingly, though, I mean, again, these are college students. Interestingly, about, I think, a third of the class has never seen any Star Trek, but they signed up for this anyway, which is really cool. Third had only seen the reboot movies, you know, the Chris Pine movies. Interesting. Yeah. The rest that had a little bit of a smattering there, you know, there was a next gen fan, Enterprise fan, you know, some original series fans, <laughs> things like that. But I thought the proportions were were not what I would have guessed ahead of time. <laughs> the one thing I can say as a, as a, someone who did a, a BA and a, and an MBA, I appreciate any professor who would assign a reasonably priced set of textbooks. So good on you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll never, yeah, this was, this was pretty cheap. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll never forget uh, buying the most expensive textbook I ever bought in my life was for an art history class. And it was, you know, oh, one man. of these like 14 inch by eight inch, you know, 500 page tomes, with full yeah. color plates on every other page. And it was, I think, 300 and something dollars. Oh, my goodness. You know, oh and this goodness. was a long time ago. That book yeah. today, I didn't even know what it would cost. And I just yeah. remember like crying, not only from having to buy it, but having <laughs> to carry that doggone thing every day. So good on you, sir. I, I, I hope Thank I hope you. that other professors will write and use their own materials because you'll it'll probably be a better experience for the students and uh, helpful for the pocketbook. Yeah, we had we had a fun experience with the spring break class last year too, where um, as a surprise for the students. So I figured that most of them probably hadn't watched Voyager, for example, just like given the proportions I just told you. So we watched the episode uh, "Favorite Son." Mm -hmm. Do you remember that one? We watched that episode, and there's a lot of genetics terms in it. And then we, afterwards, we talked about it and introduced the different genetics terms, and you know, had them assess, you know, what what would make this happen, what 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 are feasible, what's not feasible, things like that. And then the last question I asked them all was like. If you were to talk to somebody from this, uh, one of the one of the actors from the show, what might you ask them? You know, and they came up with a couple of questions. I said, "Okay, hang on a sec. I stepped out of the room and I came back in with Garrett Wong. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> said, Look at that! It's Ensign Harry Kim. <laughs> Look at that! You, you you turned your class into a Star Trek convention right there. Yeah, it's, right? it's a convention fun. <laughs> it was funny, like seeing the eyes of the kids like that big because they they just watched that episode. So. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> One of them told me afterwards they thought it was a uh, uh, one of those actor, fake actor. What do you call them? The, the oh, an, an impersonators. Uh, an impersonator. Yes, exactly. One of them thought it was an impersonator. Like no, <laughs> I love Garrett, but I don't think there's a whole lot of Garrett Wong impersonators. I, yeah, I doubt there. it. No, he's he's to, and not that, but he's just like one of the nicest guys and is totally legit. He is amazing. Yeah. He, I mean, the fact he came to do this was incredibly generous. He's always been like just the nicest guy in general, but that the fact he did that was incredibly generous and it meant the world. To the students. Oh, that's wonderful. I, I, I don't yeah. think I ever had an experience like that in any of my classes in college. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so let me ask you something that's tangentially related to Threshold is sure. in my research for this, I came across a fake scientific paper 
I'm very familiar with it. <laughs> very fa- so do tell what what is going on here that someone would write a fake paper and submit it to a to a to a science journal uh, about Voyager. What about a Voyager episode? What what is going on here? Well, let me preface by the, uh, with the comment about you referred to it as a science journal. So this the journals which received this article, I just happen to know, <laughs> are all what are referred to as predatory journals. So about 10 years ago, uh, uh, a movement called the open access movement became very popular in science. The idea behind it is very, very forward thinking and positive. And the idea is that we should all be able to see the results of science. Like you should be able to get it without you know, being at a university library. You should be able to just download you know, scientific results because partly because your taxpayer dollars pay for a lot of that. I mean, that's, where, that's what funds the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, and the same for people from other countries as well. So why is why are these things always locked up in library subscriptions? So what ends up happening now for those for good open access journals, not the predatory ones, what, what happens with those now is that when you write up the study, you send it, it goes through peer review. That, that's always what's happened. So other scientists comment on it. And if they find that the science is good, they say it's acceptable. And then you use your grant money to then pay the publication charges for that, which then makes it so libraries don't have to subscribe, that it's just freely available online. Nice. That sounds great. Now, what happened is these these predatory journals are essentially like people who can basically just host a website. They can call it a journal. They receive your scientific results. They basically just accept it and say, "Okay, give us several hundred dollars now and we'll post it online for you. We're making the scientific literature available. But in fact, they're not really doing peer review. They're not doing you know, a rigorous you know, assessment of is this good science or not. So in this particular case with the with threshold scientific paper, something like 10 scientific journals, quote unquote, these are the predatory ones, received <laughs> this article, which is basically just recounts the scenes in threshold. And we'll put a link up to this in the show notes. I'm sure it's available online. The title of the paper is Rapid Genetic and Developmental Morphological Change Following Extreme Celerity. That's a lot of jargon in there, but it basically just means you change a lot in how you look and, and your genes after going really, really fast. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> the, uh, the authors are Thomas Paris, Harry Kim, Bolana Torres, Kes Ocampa, nice. Catherine Janeway, and Louis Zimmerman. And the affiliation says Department of Biomedical Engineering, Starfleet Academy, 601 Murray Circle, Sausalito, California. You know, and it has the email address on there. So if you go through it, I mean, it's interesting that the the introduction there is actually fairly reasonable. And it actually cites real scientific papers that you could look up all the papers that are cited in it. They're all real. (laughs) But then as you get to the methods, they say, we employed a replicated design wherein two human subjects were exposed to theoretical maximum celerity, parentheses, warp 10. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and <examined. laughs> it goes through the, the, the set of things that were done to them. There's some things actually in there which you might think are a joke, but are actually real. So one of the things in there says, referring to their DNA sequences, approximately 100x coverage was achieved for each time point. DNA sequences from the various time points were cleaned, assembled, aligned, and analyzed for differences using the Picard command line tools package following GATK best practices standard. That actually, you could probably find that sentence in a lot of real scientific papers because that's actually a real thing. And it actually was named after Jean-Luc Picard. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, so that's actually real. (laughs) But then you go to the results. Immediately following maximum celerity, human subjects exhibited somnolescence that was readily terminated with audible stimulation. Means they were asleep (laughs) and you could wake them up by saying something. (laughs) This this somnolescence was associated with slightly elevated hypothalamic serum serotonin. They just said that in the episode. Within a few hours, subjects began to experience an unspecified general histamine response to normal environmental inputs. So that's basically an allergic reaction to water. You may remember all these things. These are all things that yeah, happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And subsequent reduced neural activity. That's when Tom Paris died briefly. <laughs> This response lasted no more than four hours. Then, you know, it talks later on about things like um, measurement of heart number increasing twofold. <laughs> Meaning that dramatic line from the EMH of he has two hearts. Yes. <laughs> but the best of the last paragraph, the results, because of the high mutation rate, we sought to examine if fertility was impaired. Two subjects were allowed to breed and a litter of three viable motile progeny were produced with no obvious external physical deformity relative to the parents. There you space go. Babies, <laughs> space slug babies. Space slug baby. So <laughs> apparently going really, really fast can result in space slug babies. So says the quote unquote scientific literature. <laughs> I love it. So obviously this was just a practical joke. This was not, <laughs> this wasn't something that 
Well, we know it didn't happen, of course. Somebody might wonder, like, what does this say about the scientific literature and things like that? Really, the journals that this went to are ones that I think nobody would think there was real science going on. In fact, some of the journals that were targeted were the same ones that a few years earlier had the paper about midichlorines on, in Star Wars. Oh, right. <laughs> so, Isn't this related in some way, in, in, at least in my head, just as an observer to this whole thing, related to this whole reproducibility issue and science that's going on right now? where people are trying to replicate famous papers and famous studies, typically in the social sciences, but I imagine some of this is happening in biology as well, and they're not able to reproduce the results? It's not really related to that. I mean, I think this this is a problem for sure, but I don't think any scientists ever go to these papers and then try to reproduce them and then have, have difficulty doing so. I think people know that these are just trash. I mean, people go, people know which journals are, or I'm sorry, I, I, should, I should clarify that, practicing scientists know which are the journals that have you know reliable scientific results and have rigorous peer review and they they use right. those. No, no. now the reproducibility the re- reproducibility crisis is very real and i think that has to do more with statistics that we often tend to do a study and we say okay the probability of this happening by chance is something like one in 50 and we say okay well that's very very unlikely on the other hand what if the study what if similar studies have been done a hundred times yeah. then we might get, we might get some of these things popping up and that's where the reproducibility crisis comes in more often I, I take your point I was thinking of it more as as someone who is not in a scientific field and, yes. and so yes. when you say oh someone published a paper that had to do with some Star Trek thing and it was a joke haha and and it mm-hmm. sort of feeds that idea that well I don't know if if I'm just some person who's not an academician who you know spends my life yes. doing this stuff it, it, yeah. it goes to the credibility of the scientific endeavor in the populace. That's that's fair. That's a fair criticism. I, I could see that. Yeah. It's interesting. And I was uh, actually, I heard an interview on another podcast with a guy and I don't remember what school he was from. I'll try, I'll try to find it and put it in the show notes if I can. But mm-hmm. he started a whole institute or group and all they're doing is trying to replicate uh, psychology experiment uh, experiments. That's great. It, that's yeah. Great. And, but you know, the problem is, is that, you know, out of the first 50 he did, I think it was less than 10, he was able to replicate. And of course, you can imagine like what some of those, you know, if if some of those people are still alive who did the original studies are, ah, your methodology was flawed. You didn't do it exactly the way I did it. You know, you you did it when it was raining as opposed to when it was sunny, you know, or whatever. Yeah. And the problem is some of those are real, too. I mean, sometimes it really is whether you did it when it was raining or when it was sunny. Yeah. (laughs) That that really may be that may be true. It it could be. And and I think that it just as as someone who's on the outside who has an interest in this stuff, it's very hard to to make your way through it. And so we're we're really in a place where we have to rely on the on the experts and we have to assume that people there there are some people out there that are trying to do the best they can and see how things shake out over the long term. But when we see a, you know, a news article that says, Oh, studies today say caffeine is great. Study tomorrow says caffeine is bad. You know, I I tend to be very skeptical about all that. And like, you know, come back to me in 10 years about this stuff and we'll, we'll we'll see. (laughs) I do feel like journalists are starting to get pretty good at knowing which journals are pretty reliable in the context of things like that. Like I think if, when they say things like the uh, caffeine is good or caffeine is bad, they rely on studies from, say, for example, the New England Journal of Medicine or something like that, something which has a very rigorous peer review. I don't think they'd pick up something from these predatory journals so much. But still, your point is well taken in the sense that like, in terms of public confidence in science, yeah, that, that does relate to that issue. Let me ask you a question about this. Now, you're a professor at a major university. You are an editor of a premier journal. You you obviously have a... We do peer review. We're not predatory. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, (laughs) you you obviously have a a very demanding full-time job doing research and teaching and all of this. Why did you spend all of this time writing a Star Trek book? I mean, it's not going to help you with your CV. So it must yeah. have been a labor of love for you. Why did you do it? It was very much a labor of love. So the, the proximate reason, besides, well, I'll come back to the ultimate reason. The proximate reason was I got a query from a representative with Princeton University Press saying, would you be willing to write a book for us and also do a deliver a public talk? And it has to be something that would be of general interest to the public, not something that's just for other scientists. So in terms of my, I'm an evolutionary biologist. The public talk I give the most often is basically a talk on why evolution is true. My former PhD advisor, Jerry Coyne, actually wrote a book whose title is Why Evolution is True. That book already exists. There's no way I'm going to top it. I mean, it's, it's a fantastic book. And, I, and you know, I encourage listeners to get that if you're interested in the evidence for evolution. So I couldn't compete with that. My field of study is the genetic changes it takes to make new species. So we call that speciation. Again, my former PhD advisor has written an excellent book called Speciation. There's no way I could top that. So she said, well, there are any other things you give public lectures on? This is, again, about 2016 when she asked me this question. I said, well, there is something 
It's a little bit different <laughs> from your normal. <laughs> this may not be what you were expecting. <laughs> this may not be what you were expecting. So I had a draft version of one of my talks, which I put on YouTube, which actually was incredibly helpful. I have to thank the Star Trek community for this. I put a draft of my talk on before going to Dragon Con, I put a draft of it on YouTube and I, I posted in the Dragon Con Trek Track Facebook group that the link was there and I asked for it feedback. And people gave me a lot of really helpful feedback on the talk. So I shared that same link with the publisher and she said, this is really interesting. I think I would like to pursue this. So that was the, the proximate reason of what's, what got the ball rolling for it. The ultimate reason, as you said, it's a labor of love. This is something I was already, I, I love Star Trek. This was a great chance to just go through and, and put not just the, the elements of the talks I had been giving, but just a comprehensive look at all this material together. As I was starting the book, I also thought this would be a really fun thing to do, say, a, a freshman non-majors class on. Just a fun, different way to introduce topics from genetics and evolution as opposed to the usual just memorize this, memorize that sort of aspect. So it was just great doing it. Honestly, the science was the easier part. The hardest part was really the trek because I had to make sure that I didn't miss anything. That's where, as I mentioned at the very beginning of our interview here, I had to go through all those episodes. And people say, why don't you just do like a word search for the relevant terms? The problem is Trek episodes don't necessarily use the same terms that would be used in the academic literature. So I really had to go through, start to finish every episode, and make sure that something wasn't in there that was relevant. So, for example, there's a, re there's a reference in Up the Long Ladder in, in TNG to replicative fading. That is the kind of thing that if you make a, a clone off a clone off a clone, you eventually start having a lot of problems. That is a real process. We know this is true. We know this is true from asexual organisms that, you know, essentially that's making a clone off a clone off a clone. We don't call it repli replicative fading. That's actually a pretty decent term, though. <laughs> but if I just did a word search, I would never have found that because I would never have thought to search for that. Right. Oh, that's where the uh, highly advanced uh, species was look was having cloning errors. And they were looking for exactly. humans to donate some DNA. Yeah, exactly. to clone. Okay, right. I remember that one. That's why sexual reproduction is good is because it basically helps, you know, essentially you can, you can patch over the, the bad pieces with, with, with good pieces by mixing it up. But as you're just making copies, you know, any error that was present in the previous one is still going to be there in the next one, plus a whole set of new errors. And that's one of the issues with asexual reproducing species. One of the challenges I imagine in writing a book like that is, is a similar challenge to what I think we've had on this podcast, which is when, whenever you talk about the science in, in Star Trek, it might be easy to fall into sort of a pattern of nitpicking at the death. Yes, and, yes. and so how did you manage that in the book? Because I enjoyed the book and it didn't seem like you were nitpicking or trying to beat up on anybody, which I really appreciated. Thank you. But how did you manage that when you were sort of putting it together? A big part of it for me was just keeping in mind the audience. I mean, people don't want to read something which is just trashing Star Trek. Because either you're a Star Trek fan, in which case you're going to get alienated, or you're not a Star Trek fan, in which you don't care. <laughs> so I, I just I just had to remember the audience as I was writing the book and, and try to be consciously trying to identify, okay, these are not scientists who are putting this together. What are the good elements? What are the things that we can take from this? What are the lessons that can be learned? Even if something was depicted incorrectly, there's sometimes a good aspect to it. Like, for example, with the tardigrade example I was talking about earlier, the fact that they referred to something that was a very recent scientific result in the in the literature, that's fantastic. Yeah, and they were trying. They just got on Exactly. They were clearly trying. They just got unlucky that that particular thing happened to be something that was disproven. And, you know, fair enough that they didn't catch it. You know, fair enough. But the fact that they tried to do that was great. Threshold, threshold is a little bit harder. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, other things come up periodically where, like, you know, sometimes they just get lucky in a, in a good way. So, for example, Tribbles, right? This is actually something I think one of the writers actually tweeted about this incorrectly, which I thought was kind of funny. But um, there was a quote from McCoy saying these are they're bisexual and reproducing at will. Uh, one of the writers recently tweeted something saying, oh, Tribbles are asexual. There's a huge difference between being bisexual and asexual. And in terms of like the thing we were talking about, this replicative fading, it's way better to be bisexual than to be asexual. Even if you're even if you're self-fertilizing, you're still allowing some opportunity for a good piece to substitute for the bad piece in in the offspring. In fact, let, that, let me oh, let me ahead. just get the terms right for for the listeners. So an asexual sure. reproduction means I'm just basically trying to clone myself and my offspring. So if I'm exactly. a brown trouble with white spots, I'm going to have a brown trouble with white spots as my offspring. Exactly. Whereas, Plus any mutations. Yes. Right. <laughs> which, you know, which are which is the, where the problems creep in. Exactly. But, it, but when you say bisexual reproduction or self-fertilization, so yeah. where are those other copies of DNA coming from? So, so imagine now that imagine if you're bisexual, what's going to happen is you can get you, essentially you are you have you have two copies of your genome, and what, the offspring will not necessarily be identical to you, even though you're giving you're, even though you're even though the offspring will also have two copies. It could have for a particular gene, it could have two of the same, or it could have 
one of one of one and one of the other. You see what I mean? Gotcha. So if one of them is problematic, you could then potentially get the other one in there. And then and then the offspring from that may have two of the good ones. So you would know that if we see the brown triple suddenly giving birth and its offspring, yes. it has one white offspring, one purple one and one brown with a blue yeah. stripe in it. Exactly. Exactly. Excellent. Excellent. Exactly. And that was that would actually that worked really well. There's a lot of things that, that crept into episodes that were that were also more intentional. So going back to the um the episode with the horde up. Devil in the dark. They, yeah. Yeah, Devil in the Dark. There's a great quote in there, which was just it was just said very quickly when Spock first hypothesizes the idea that maybe it's a silicon-based life form. McCoy says uh, silicon-based life is physiologically impossible, especially in an oxygen atmosphere. That was a very specific quote in there, you know, that, especially in an oxygen atmosphere. It's interesting that he said that because typically speaking, the reason you know, we're carbon-based. Carbon is great for life because it forms these long chains with itself. So you can have a carbon attached to a carbon attached to a carbon and have, you know, hydrogens and oxygens off on the sides. And that's why it's, it's flexible. This is the basis for carbohydrates, for proteins, for nucleic acids like DNA or RNA, for fats. I mean, that is, you know, what makes us what we are. Silicon doesn't work nearly as well because silicon doesn't like to make the same sorts of long chains, particularly because silicon's more, it's happier binding to oxygen than another silicon. So essentially that being in an oxygen atmosphere is going to make it much less likely you can get those long stretches. And the fact that he said that, I think that was very insider. And I was, I was very pleasantly surprised to hear that in there. Actually, I think, I guess when I first heard that as a kid, I had no idea that that was relevant. But later as I started looking into it, like, oh, that actually does make See, sense. See, that shows that they were trying. They were definitely trying and That's wonderful. They, were, they were good about it. Yeah, absolutely. So finding those kinds of things and putting those into the book was something I made a conscious effort to do just to make sure I didn't go into sort of a, a dark place of just, you know, as my colleague Eric Spann always calls it, shooting fish in a barrel. I mean, they're not scientists. Of course, like the science is not going to be perfect. So, I mean, it's just not constructive for anybody to do that. And the readers don't want to read that. So I was trying to basically put a mix together. So I'm, I'm glad that you felt that way as you're reading it, too. That's great. One of the things I think that's really special about Star Trek is even though they don't certainly have a high batting average when it comes to getting the science perfect, is that it's really inspired a lot of people to be interested in science and for them to go do their own reading and even some people to go get educated and, and do science as yeah. a as a full time yep. profession. So I think yeah. if there's one thing when you can put science and Star Trek together, it may not be the science in the show, but it's mm -hmm. the it's the science that it inspired people to do because it awakened Absolutely. something in them as they were watching it, which I think is a beautiful thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I 100 percent agree. Like, I mean, the example people often use is Dr. Mae Jemison, you know, the first African-American astronaut. She was inspired by seeing Uhura there on Star Trek. That's fantastic. I can't think of a better spot to move into the final section of the show. Oh, because I got to tell you that the M5 is signaling me that it's time for the Kobayashi Maru. Oh, I'm excited. The Kobayashi <laughs> Maru is a challenging and difficult test, cunningly prepared by the M5 Multitronic unit. Should you not only survive the test, but pass it as well? The M5 will award you an honorary Star Trek title. Are you ready? Yes, I am ready. M5, load the Kobayashi Maru simulation and prepare to record the professor's responses. M5 acknowledges. Which of these is more outrageous? The giant space amoeba from the original series episode, The Immunity Syndrome, or the SETI eels from Star Trek II? The giant space amoeba. You're arranging a dinner for some Klingon friends. The main dish will be Rokeg Blood Pie. Which is the better side dish? Hippias Claw or Bricket Lung? Bricket Lung. Choose your attire, Captain. Kirk's green wraparound tunic or the usual gold green pullover? Usual gold green pullover. <laughs> Which disease is worse? The quickening disease from the founders in the Gamma Quadrant or the Vidian Phage from the Delta Quadrant? Vidian Phage. Which is worse? Getting sucked into the mirror universe or being assimilated by the Borg? Assimilated by the Borg. Simulation complete. M5, please compute the results and tell us if our guest has passed the Kobayashi Maru. It's no win, so I guess I couldn't. No, well, you know what? The, the M5 is working on it, but uh, I thought you did great. So let's, let's see what the M5 has to say. M5 working. <laughs> Professor Noor, I am pleased to tell you that the M5 has determined that you have passed the Kobayashi Maru simulation. Congratulations. Yay. I didn't even yeah. cheat. You. <laughs> <laughs> I actually <laughs> met with the Anovos guys, the Anovos people at the Star Trek convention one year, and they totally educated me I love your about the idea that gold outfit isn't actually gold in TOS. 
Oh yeah, about that it's actually green. Yeah, but it's the lighting, and they, you know, it yeah. was so early days for color TV. They didn't even realize how the whole thing would work out. Yeah, but it, yeah. I, I, I just read that recently. I wouldn't have known otherwise. Yeah, it's it's really amazing. <laughs> you know, and the first uh, experience I had is when I bought the color correct Novos tie. They sell the mm. t- the TOS material as a necktie. And, and I, I remember looking at it thinking, like, this looks like olive green mustard. It doesn't look <laughs> like the gold. And then they had to explain it to me. And they're like, no, no, that's the real color. <laughs> it's just when you put yeah, it under the yeah. lights, it looks gold. <laughs> that's so be it. That's awesome. Yeah. And I love the giant space amoeba. So that was definitely the right choice. Oh, good. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I don't, actually, the city eel, I don't think that's that. I mean, I guess the, the problem is just what does it normally eat? But, I mean, it, the city eel was there presumably before... The, the planet got its orbit shifted or whatever. So, oh, yeah, it would have had to have been. Yeah. So, I mean, that sense, like, I didn't think, I didn't think there was anything that crazy about it. And, you know, it bros itself into in, into your head and affects you. But it, the fact that it makes you susceptible is probably not its purpose. It's probably like just sucking blood or something in there, or brain fluid or who knows what. <laughs> if I was to speculate, my feeling on it is that, of course, they were indigenous to SETI Alpha 5, but they probably only lived yeah. in like a very limited part of the planet, you know, maybe in the beaches yeah. or somewhere where there was sand or something like that. And yeah. then when the yep. when you know when the environment changed, they, they found the whole planet all much over. more hospitable. Exactly, like roaches. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they just they just took over the place. Yeah, you know. Yeah. The other no brainer I thought was the mirror universe versus assimilated by the Borg. Like yeah, that was a no brainer. <laughs> I don't want to be assimilated by the Borg. The mirror universe. Presumably you could find something good. I mean, we saw the the group there that had the the alternate folk it was fine. You could hang out with them. Yeah, yeah. The resistance. Exactly. Sure. There's no there's no good side of it being someone with the board. Well, you know, seven of nine, you know, she she broke free. Yeah. She, she broke free. I mean, but that, that, that requires an extra step of end breaking free. <laughs> that's true. That's true. But, you know, same thing with getting out of the mirror universe. It requires, you know, somebody to help yeah. you. But you, maybe you can make a life over there. You know, if you that's what I was thinking. Like, maybe it'd be OK. You, you just got to avoid all all the insane humans which, uh, with their yeah. wild xenophobia and, and uh, hatred of the other, which is, you know, anybody that doesn't look like them. So. I did a video cast with uh, Garrett and Aaron Eisenberg about a uh, about a nice. year ago, and <laughs> I forget the question came up about what I would look like. So I'm I'm kind of bald on top. The question came up about what I would look like in the mirror universe, and Aaron Eisenberg comment is, "You'd have a mohawk." <laughs> 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 that was a great response. <laughs> I, I, uh, yeah, well, I, I shaved my head, so I would probably have long, flowing, luxurious locks or something. You know, yep. which I I don't I don't go. have. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The M5 is telling me that it's time for your title. It has analyzed your answers and is going to award you an honorary Star Trek title. M5, what title shall we award our guest? Dr. Noor is awarded the title of Special Visiting Professor of Xenobiology at the Vulcan Science Institute. Yes. Does that come with money? <laughs> I was like, a them. big fat honorarium <laughs> and a Vulcan salute for me. So there you go. <laughs> No Latin. No I, maybe. I don't know. You'd have to talk to, uh, you know, the paymaster over there at the Vulcan Science Institute, you know. Yeah. You and, go. you know, the, I, I would imagine they're pretty harsh taskmasters. You do your best teaching a course, you get wonderful reviews and tell you if your performance was, yeah. you know, it's probably the best. They wouldn't, li- they wouldn't like me. They wouldn't like me. They said I laughed way too much. <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with that as far as I'm concerned. Dr. Noor, please tell people how they can get in touch with you. Sure. Um, I, I'm on Twitter at at M-A-F Noor and like November O-O-R. You can also find my website at, at Duke University if you go to www.duke.edu and just search for my name. My last name is spelled Noor and like November O-O-R. You can find email address or contact information there. Fantastic. And I'll put links to all that on the on the show notes page over at Trek Profiles. Thank you so much for being a part of the show. Thank you for having me. It was really fun. Here ends this installment of the Trek Profiles podcast. And before we offer a Trek quote to close this episode, I'd like to remind you that you may send us your encouraging thoughts, lingua code friendship messages, or subspace mixtapes at feedback at trekprofiles.com or on Facebook or Twitter at Trek Profiles. Anything you send us may be used in the show or may be sent to the Klingon Monastery on Borath as tribute to Galish. This week, I leave you with a quote from Captain Janeway, who in the episode Threshold said, quote, I thought about having children, but I must say, I never considered having them with you. Close quote. Thanks for listening and live long and prosper. Mm-hmm.